I don't know. Two guys on a trail with a pitched tent. I, I hmm. you tuned out at that point. It's concerned at the very least. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys podcast. I am Big Z. I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery. And we're excited to have you back for episode six of the podcast. Uh, really have been getting into our groove with us and excited to keep expounding on this. And uh, uh, we have a pretty awesome next year coming ahead. But uh, this episode's going to be focused on looking back what happened over 2019. A whole lot of awesome. Yeah, a lot, a lot of interesting industry stuff's happened. Uh, we've been to a number of different events and seen a number of different things. Uh, a lot of cool stuff, a lot of interesting uh, conceptual stuff. And uh, it's going to be fun to look, kind of look back and see what's happened in our industry. Something that we've uh, we talk about all the time Absolutely. in the garage and off, offline. So before we jump into the... Uh, the episode uh, kind of wanted to look back at some news that happened over the last week or so uh, since we lost lost since we last shot our uh, podcast. Uh, so the interesting thing that happened last week was uh, Roxor um, lost a legal battle in court about the Jeep trademark grill that they've been using um, on their Roxor machines. And it's not that they've lost like the ability to sell their machines. It's the fact that their grill looks too much like a Jeep grill. And that's what uh, Daimler Chrysler or whoever owns them now was suing them for uh, to try to get them out of the States. But basically, um, they've been using the, the fact that they have a five slot grill versus the Jeep seven slot grill. This last week, they got kind of set back on going back to court on on that whole issue. So uh, Mahindra is leaning into it. They're going to all the shows and showing their machines off and all that. But uh, possibly look forward to an interesting legal battle in 2020 over uh, the rocks for machines in the event that they have to make some changes i really don't see it slowing their momentum down that machine is uh it just, it's picking up a lot of popularity i've noticed so yeah it's definitely a very interesting vehicle for the guys that need something that can be street legal like right. outside of like the 30 mile an hour roads and these can be so it's an interesting idea i i don't i've never seen it directly as a competitor to side by sides they just they don't do the same thing. They just happen right. to have two seats and be open. Yeah, I see it as uh, you know, I see it gaining some popularity with farmers, hunters, and I right. see that trend to con continuing for sure. Especially if the, if there's no issues with it driving on the road and driving on the street legally. Yep. And uh, the other thing was that we saw some rumors about Can Am. Well, not rumors. They patent. They filed for a patent on a rear steer kit for their Mavericks. Um, and we're assuming it's the Mavericks based off of the the radius rod linkage system that they were showing in the drawings. But um, so Can Am possibly maybe a rear steer RC model in twenty one. So if you're to play Monday morning quarterback, you see this as a game changer. That it's a pretty big deal um, in that it is a feature set no one else has even ever considered bring into production. I get it. I see it talked about a lot. Yeah. In, and in there's threads. a lot of off-roaders that are right. transitioning from trucks to side-by-sides and they're used to having rear steer in their custom fab operation. So, uh, you know, having a factory uh, provided one could definitely be a big changer for them in the, in the rock crawling market. Going back to the conversation we had about um, niche market customized UTVs in the future, uh, the possibility of having a sand car come out or a more right. rock focused car or a, a more trail focused car. Um, this could be leaning straight into that whole theory that we had of seeing these very niche cars coming out. Um, yeah. In, in the West Coast, though, you know, it kind of makes me wonder if we're going to see it a heck of a lot. Where, where are you going to be riding where you're going to unlock the potential of that unless all of a sudden mud really has a culture shift up in our neck of the woods. I, I mean, I think really where you're going to see this stuff is in the South and the Southeast. Yeah, I could see it though. Like if you're talking about North Idaho, rock crawling, trailing, yeah. um, things like that, where you're going in and out of obstacles, rear steer could definitely be utilized. I don't foresee it ever being on a high performance machine. I don't think you're going to ever see it on a turbo R, turbo RR. R. You're only going to ever see it on an RC or maybe a, a sport. Um, the drawings that they showed were on... Um, also showed double A arm suspension, which would imply maybe like the Maverick Sports, um, things like that. 
but uh, having having a rear steer from the factory would be a, at least an interesting concept of an option that they could offer when you're buying at the dealer. If you're going in, I need to buy a machine for the trails and for rock crawling, um, or just around my property, it's really tight in certain areas, I need to be able to get a smaller machine in and out of certain areas. Uh, that could be a huge, a huge win for them. So. Right, right. From from patenting it to uh, seeing the sales floor, you know that could take a pretty substantial amount right. of time. So we'll, you know. Well, when we our, saw the rumors for the the, we saw the drawings for the Pro XP before we knew it was a Pro XP. Right. That was two years before it was launched. Yeah, yeah. There, there were pictures uh, circulating that uh, everybody was. Uh, basically thinking that it was an RS1 yeah, and then it wound up being the Pro XP. And, and I th- if I remember right, you dated that from the, when those pictures were released. Yeah, it was the, almost two years. Yeah, yeah. yeah, And the same thing happened with the Kawasaki. We started seeing patents being filed right. that were, were indicators of the KRX coming out a good two and a half years before it ever came right. out. So uh, it's going to be a while before we see it. Um, but uh, it's interesting just to see the momentum and the progression of the manufacturers going into uh, this next, um, I don't want to call it season, but it's the next era of side-by-sides where they're actually having to up the game quite a bit to be competitive. And meanwhile, my beloved Suzuki remains quiet. No news, <laughs> no rumors, sitting yeah. idly, unless you're a quad guy, nothing to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, Suzuki is, is one of those weird ducks where it's like, yeah, they still exist, but no one on the street ever talks about them, has yeah. them on top of mind. Like, yeah. they, they have nothing across their entire product portfolio, like in the top 10 of anything. Yeah, I mean, they do a lot of things exceptionally well, but uh, they're not really known as the pinnacle. You know, like you got the GSXR, you've got uh, King Quads, very loyal following in those two realms. But uh, yeah, they're not they're not really separating themselves, and I don't see right. that changing anytime soon. Yeah. Unfortunate. Unfortunate. All right, so let's uh, jump into the year in review. 2019 has been quite an interesting year for side-by-sides. I wouldn't say it was a revolutionary year. Um, it wasn't like a 2016 or you know something like that. Uh, but 2019 has definitely been an interesting mix of new and changes and things like that. So, kind of just want to go through you know what's happened from January to December and uh, kind of review some newsmakers and some events we've went to, some products, things like that, and kind of just review you know what this year what this year had for us. All right, so starting in January. Um, it was coming out of 2018, right? We are coming off of um, the Turbo S really being a, a gangbusters hit for Polaris. Uh, we're talking about Honda late in the year releasing the Honda Talon. Um, those types of things were, were all coming out. And around that time, we're also talking about um, kind of getting seated in the idea that Textron took over arctic cat right so the wildcat became the textron wildcat and all that so going into january it's usually a quiet time for the side-by-side market Uh, there's really not a whole lot going on things are getting colder wetter snowier um and so the newsmakers really aren't there in january right uh but we saw um kind of the follow-up to the Talon release, and Honda came out with their pricing uh, being 20K for the Talon X and 21K for the Talon R. Main difference is being suspension um, on the cars and getting that five-link rear suspension um, and a little bit wider stance, right? Yeah, one was kind of directed towards a little bit of a a versatile platform, whereas one was kind of directed towards a little bit more trail-oriented. Right. Yeah. One was more sport, sport. Right. And one was more trail sport. Right. And uh, so 20,000, 21,000 at the time, uh, there was a lot of groans and moans about that being overpriced, especially for a launch product, uh, first gen. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Was that price appropriate or do you think it was a little high? I think it was a little high, but uh, it's not surprising to see him successful with the car. You know, uh, we talked about it in prior episodes where what you can get for that amount of money. And I think you and I are in complete agreement that there's probably a different avenue that we would pursue for that for that money. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not a great machine because it is. It's it's proving itself to be a, a formidable, naturally aspirated machine. No question about it. Um, I'm not hearing uh, an, a large amount of bad feedback or anything of that nature when it comes to that machine. So uh, I think I speak for everybody where we would like to see it somewhere maybe around maybe sixteen five, eighteen five. You know, I think the turbo cars are priced 
too competitive uh, and too close to this for them to really think it's going to make some sort of a culture shift. Right. And I, and I think that uh, it's very possible going into maybe next year or maybe the 21 season uh, where Honda comes out with maybe a high performance version, uh, pushing the price on these down a little bit. Um, I think they were just up front saying, hey, this is our first entry. We don't want to just uh, lose money. Uh, we want to make money. And, um, you know, they've they've kept the dealer options, you know, pretty flexible as well. Um, I never heard any feedback from the dealer saying that they couldn't sell them. Right. Um, they were able to get them out the doors. I haven't heard of any dealer just sitting on inventory. So, right. um, you know, the price, according to the market, is probably feasible because the guys that are haunted the hot that are Honda loyalists are they're not looking at the price tag they're looking at the brand right and so uh, the machine came out it was a good quality machine it handled well it does a lot of things well it's not a game changer in any way it's not a, a standout you know different machine um, outside of maybe that five link suspension but it hasn't really done anything that to wow the industry outside of the fact that it's well built it's solid it's a good release for a first attempt and people want to buy it so of the uh, Japanese manufacturers, if someone's going to make the jump to forced induction, which one do you see doing it? Honda. I do too. Yeah. yeah I agree. And, uh, you know, with them launching uh, later, uh, you know, that year, I mean, actually, it was actually pretty early in the year, right right around the pricing uh, area, uh, they, they said that they were going to launch their Honda racing team. So they have their um, their their rally the rally cars and their Baja cars all and their racers are all lined up to do to do UTV racing. So I would say that uh, they're going to try to get their foot wet this year, uh, this summer, or in this next 2020 summer, and then I think out of that will become the development of their uh, forced induction and the next version of the Talon series. And then to speak to you know who's going to come out of forced induction, um, you know. We talked a little bit last time about Textron really not doing anything. Uh, they were uh, coming out of that whole rebrand process and the industry's basically rejection and regurgitation of everything they threw at them. And they came out in January saying, hey, you know, we heard you. We're going to bring back the Articat name, leave it untouched so that we're not uh, losing more than we already are. And uh, in brand equity and in sales. Um, you know, they said specifically, quote, the Arctic Cat name will be returning to the off-road in 2019 with a legacy of innovation, performance, and fun. This legendary brand is coming back because Arctic Cat fans and power sports enthusiasts demanded it. And I think that's a very uh, light way of putting it. Yeah, to recapture market share, I really don't know what it's going to take to get them back on track. You know, I mean, it could take an, an um, basically an evolution of their existing product or or a new platform altogether. Right. And I, and I think it would also require them to get away from the Robbie Gordon patents. That Wildcat machine is a great machine, but if they're going to change anything, they would have to get away from that and go back to maybe either the standard A-arm, trailing arm platform that everyone else has, or come out with an even more trophy truck-inspired suspension linkage system to which they would own the patent or get away from uh, losing their money on it um, to provide a better, more unique machine. Otherwise, I don't foresee them sticking around. They have all these different like rebranding options with Tracker and Bass Pro Shops and, and all these other places where they're rebranding the machines and selling them that way. Um, I just don't see that as a big enough market to support them, though, without without them changing. I think all of these OEs have learned a lesson that if you're going to come out with a uh, product, you need to move the needle. You need to push the envelope a little bit. And do we need right now, do we need another naturally aspirated option? The answer is yes. But as an enthusiast, unless that option is a clear, definitive step, you know, making uh, essentially making progress, performing better, uh, pr faster, lighter, more, better handling this, that, and the other. I really think that uh, I hate to use the term "wasting your time," but in a nutshell, that's kind of what it is. Right, and you know, a lot of these manufacturers might be doing that. They might have development programs that are three years out, and they have to push it. You know, with just incremental visual changes to their machines. Right. Um, I foresee the future of that needle being moved, being based and founded out of you know higher quality, higher strength, um, 
you know, more reliability, things like that, where they can say, like with the Pro XP, right? They came out and, the, and they said, that, you know, the chassis is stronger, it's stiffer. You know, that's the stuff that's going to start selling these support machines higher or faster than just the fact that they came out with a, a new year model. And that's a, as a consumer, that's an acceptable way f- to me for them to move the needle forward is uh, durability. Mm-hmm. Uh, it absolutely is. I mean, obviously, we want to see performance, but in reality, you know, as it pertains to performance in the naturally aspirated category, especially when you go down through the OEs and you start to read comparisons or as you start to get time behind the wheel of these cars, you know, naturally aspirated. There's some pretty definitive. There's some. There's some cars there that are almost separate themselves definitively away from. Like if you if you want to handle, if you want to go left and right, if you want a car that just, you know, more or less provides you with a a true sport ride, I would almost I would almost basically tell it people that the Yamaha is almost a clear favorite. Right. And I think that the reviews would validate my opinion in that regard. So for these other OEs to start to develop something that's a little bit more catered towards rocks towards. Uh, like a true off-road machine or a uh, or something that's just basically a moving tank that's durable. You know, you, we're, we're right. seeing Kawasaki trend that direction. Right. I, I definitely think there's a market for that, but you know, the most visible cars are the ones that perform the best, that are the fastest, that are you know, you know where I'm going. It, right. uh, I think. Uh, I think you I think you nailed nailed it on the head. It's going to be uh, kind of a head scratcher as to whether or not they can, they look to continue down the trend that they're in, or they're looking to maybe just kind of. Uh, hit the reset button, go right. a different route. And Polaris did that a little bit in January. They launched their Velocity Series Turbo S, right? And that machine really doesn't do anything outside of what the Turbo S already did outside of take the computer out of the equation. Right. And, um, you know, they took the dynamics and the ride command out of it and then saved you 2100 bucks. But it was 2100 bucks really worth it. But to a racer, that may just be the extra little bit of savings that puts the new set of wheels or new set of tires or whatever on their machine. Uh, but for the actual consumer, the people where the actual market share is, I, I don't know how how well that was received. I mean, I see a lot of them being purchased and built. Yeah. Um, but having the the lesser quote unquote lesser shock than the dynamic shock uh, with Fox, you know, was that twenty one hundred dollars actually something saved, yeah. or was that something that they regret? We can kind of get hung up on that a little bit, but I can tell you right now in terms of all the people that I know that have bought a Turbo S, be it a Velocity or a Dynamics, I have yet to find somebody that's bought a Turbo S and regretted it. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Like I've never seen a Turbo S owner with the Dynamics shocks say anything bad about them outside of maybe they were a little squishy at first, but once they got them tuned, you know, everything was fine. Right. So, um, yeah, that, that, I think that's just a, uh, uh, evidence of that concept of we're holding out for something. So we needed to iterate in some way to keep the hype and the longevity of this new product out there so that we can hold over to the new product. Um, and that's what happened with that, with the pro XP later on in the year. And the, the turbo S is a product that was released for, um, you know, it was marketed as the beast. I really think it's lived up. Oh, for sure. It's, it it's took bad. what they already had and then just made it <laughs> yeah. what everybody was building them to be yeah. in the first place. They took any potential failure point and beefed it up. It's a right. very impressive car. So moving out of January into February, you know, there wasn't a whole lot going on. Um, you know, there, the news cycle for February is always dead. Right. Uh, there's really nothing across almost the entire sport industry that happens in February. King of hammers. <laughs> well, I mean, racing, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. You talk about desert racing and things like that. Um, but, uh, you know, King of the Hammers is fun and everything, but there's really nothing that ever comes out of that. They're doing a lot of product testing at King of the Hammers. Like if you're if you're somebody in the know and you're there, you're probably going to see a lot of cool stuff that wasn't out. But uh, for the most part, it's all unlabeled, unbadged or hidden or re- refaced to something else or, um, or whatever. But uh, for the most part, what you're seeing at the King of the Hammers is tire development. You're seeing shock development, which is all internal based. You're never going to see it. Um, you're talking about uh, possibly new accessories like you know higher uh, quality mirrors, things right. like that. But you're really not seeing anything from a visual standpoint of how the industry is going to be changing throughout the year. You're just seeing more development and R and D being played out on the race course. So, jumping out of February, uh, the snooze fest that February usually is. <laughs> uh, we go to March, um, and uh, there was, you know, I had put out a couple of videos on our on our YouTube channel. Go like, subscribe, share, please. Uh, that'd be great um, if you feel so. Uh, if you don't, then then don't. Even if you don't feel so, 
go do yeah, it. Yeah, that'd yeah, be, that'd be helpful. Yeah. Um, so we did a couple uh, videos on belt replacements and, you know, Fang Light installations, things like that, which, by the way, so I launched that Fang Light video and I was going to do a how to of, you know, here's the lights, how you install them. This is what you, the steps you need to go through. And the whole thing was so easy that I just filmed it at one handed. I just had the cell phone in one hand and then did everything with the other hand. I literally installed them with one hand. And that's how I named and titled the video that you can install them with one hand, right? And then I got a slew of people saying, why is it going so fast? Why is it in fast forward? Like, why are you not detailing out all the stuff? So I, I kind of learned my lesson on uh, if you're doing an install to take your time and don't t try to make it into something else because uh, <laughs> everybody wants to see the nitty gritty. But I was just doing it for fun to yeah. say you can do this one handed. Be aware of people and their opinion. <laughs> Well, I think everyone's entitled to voice their opinion these days, right? Everyone yeah. feels like every little thought has to be published. So. I know. I have a problem with that. I need to get over it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, in in March, the big thing for me personally was uh, that I had traded in my 2018 Polaris Razor XP4 1000 um, in Black Pearl to the 2019 uh, Razor XP4 1000 Black Pearl. Uh, so... Just that being said, you would say, why would you go from one year to the other year? There's no difference. It's literally the same color, the same model, everything. Well, it actually was a quite a bit different because it was the, the redesigned uh, fascias, lights, um, all that. And what a lot of people don't realize is that in 2019, that brought a, re a redevelopment of the front dash system. And it raised the dash two inches and the steering column two inches. So your actual riding experience changed quite a bit. And at first, I really didn't like it. I was I was used to having my hands down low, and being in that comfortable elbows low position. And uh, I really had to go through a kind of a relearning of of it's two inches makes a huge difference. That's what she said. <laughs> and uh, the steering angles and all that were different for me. Yeah. And um, it was it was a different experience. And um, it it honestly made it feel bigger. Like the machine felt bigger because there was more leg room. There was more leg height. Um, and that the steering wheel was higher, so it was more away from your chest, things like that. Uh, so it was a kind of a unique situation. Um, and then, yeah, obviously, all the visual changes, the, the right. front lights and the rear lights and all that stuff. So season, seasons play a factor. Um, kind of how things have developed over the last couple of months have played a factor. But you and I have yet to ride together. <laughs> but I know for a fact we've gone down a lot of the same trails. Oh, for sure. So as it pertains to doing a four-seater versus a two-seater where we go, uh, do you have – Anything kind of to touch on where one yeah. shines, where one where there's challenges? Right. So uh, there's going to be a little bit of difference of opinion in that um, I've always driven four-seaters. Uh, being a family man, from day one, everybody was involved. Uh, but Uncle Ben has a two-seater razor, and I've driven that a number of times, the turbo. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, your opinion's going to be a little different because you come from the YXZ two-seater background where it's very uh, compact and tight and turning races are a lot different, things like that. I still have yet to drive a four-seater. Never been yeah. behind the wheel one yet. Yeah. Yep. So the big thing that you would notice, uh, and just for those that aren't familiar with where we're at and all that, we're... No the Pacific Northwest, Northern Idaho, Eastern Washington area based. And so we do a lot of riding in North Idaho and surrounding areas. And it's mostly trail. The first thing straight out of the gate is you're going to hate the turning radius. You're talking almost double what a two seater is. And um, in 2017, Polaris upgraded the, the four seaters turning radius to match the two seaters um, steering system so that they had a, a much narrow. It was up near almost 15 feet of turning radius on the 16s and when they went to the to 17s they turned it down to almost i think it was like 13 and a half 14 feet um so it was quite a bit better and the steering um ratio was a lot better than the 16s were but uh that's the first thing everyone talks about is turning radius and just how long they are and a bear to, to navigate but once you've had at least a month of riding under your belt that perception goes away like the only time you ever worry about steering is when you're loading up and when you when you went down the wrong trail and you're on a single track or something like that where you can't really turn around real well and you have to look for a spot to do it. Outside of that, um, the thing that the four seaters are noticeably better at is just the wheelbase is so much better and more planted than a two seater. You don't feel so um, off the rails sometimes. So in a two seater, like my brother's um, turbo. 
you can be railing down corners and stuff and feel like you're action packed 100 percent of the time whereas in the four seater uh, a lot of that action packedness goes away because it feels more natural in those corners and in those different obstacles where uh, that length really helps balance and spread your your load out and um, you don't get as i'm going to put a an asterisk on this you don't feel as top heavy yeah in a, in a four seater as you do a two seater now that being said, that's with appropriately adjusted shocks for what you're doing and understanding that sometimes you have to throw the tires around a little bit to, to take care of corners to swing you out. But in a two seater, you don't have the length to whip out a lot of the time. And so you have to accept the body roll and, and, and adjust for it. Uh, so in my preference, the four seater gives you the ability to, to sling the rear end out a lot more, which in my opinion is a lot more fun. Um, but you go through tires faster. <laughs> um, and, uh, and you do have length to deal with when you're in tight spots. Yeah. Outside of that, I don't think I'd ever go back to a two seater personally. Yeah. I ride in the sand a ton and, uh, <clears throat> you know, having the ability to really charge through moguls is such a selling factor for me. It's a, it's a big benefit. And I know four seaters do it astronomically better than a two seater. And that's yep. not going to change when you get that extra wheelbase. So yeah, I'm interested to just interested to see what you were. Yeah. We'll, we'll see that. if we can't so. get out um, at one of the shows and do a demo ride on a four seater with yeah. you and see what it'd be interesting to do kind of just a, a two take on a two seater on a four seater and, and see how that goes. And we will have a chance to do that for sure in 2020. <laughs> All right, so jumping out of March into April, Polaris uh, announced that they had, uh, or I should say, the U.S. government had announced that they had used their uh, high-energy weapons for the first time to take down an actual in-operations flying drone. Um, and they had announced that it was mounted to a Polaris M Razor, which is the military spec Razor, um, probably a diesel variant. Um, and they had shown a picture of that unit mount, uh, strapped down to an aircraft carrier, the edge of an aircraft carrier. It was one of the coolest things. I wish I could have been there to take better pictures than the government did, but, um, it was pretty cool just to understand and to know the scope of the manufacturers of these machines and how they're being used around the world. It's not just out on the trail, right? These things are actually, there's actual governmental wings of these companies and they're, they're out there deployed doing the good work for us and, and, and taking care of business. Yeah. At their procurement meeting in Chicago, that machine was there on display. It wasn't easy to get get close to because there was a lot of people that were really oh, yeah. curious about it. Uh, my main takeaway, I can visualize it, but it was, uh, you know, like I said, I didn't get like right up on it, but uh, I do remember some, uh, one of the guys from Polaris saying that it's, it's pretty heavy. It's a, it's a beast. Yeah. So if you haven't seen one, um, they all come in desert tan right. variants, but, uh, the biggest thing that you, that strikes you right away is that the cage is a lot different. Oh boy, is it. And, um, the reason for that is because it's meant to be detached and swung over, uh, up onto the hood or, right. or the rear and then mounted to aerial drop cables so they can take them with a helicopter or shove them out the back of a, a cargo plane and let them parachute down, uh, things like that. So they have a direct two frame attachment points all around to where they can drop them from parachute, drop them from paracord, um, things like that. And uh, so the, the, the geometry of the frame has to be able to support that as well as the ability for guys jumping in and out that have a lot of equipment on them. So there's a lot more like headspace and things like that. Um, and then also the ability to have all these different attachment points, right. For gunners or, or, uh, cargo carrying or, or pulling trailers, things like that. So they're, they're pretty cool. They up front, you're kind of like, Oh, it's just a Brown razor. But then when you start looking at the details of it, it's actually pretty cool looking. A lot of cool, interesting things yeah. on it. In April, I actually live streamed on our YouTube channel. Go like, and subscribe. Um, the Nikola's launch of the NZT and Reckless UTVs. So speaking of military UTVs, uh, you know they they announced the Reckless platform, which is an electric UTV, um, and it's the military side of the NZT, which is the consumer electric UTV. Um, the Reckless was you know out of left side. I didn't see that happening. I was just waiting for the consumer one to come out, but they they launched with this reckless unit and this reckless unit unit is, you know, the same thing as the M razor where it's, it's all tan camo and it's all uh, military spec and, and all that. They want to compete for those government um, contracts as well. And they, they launched it with like a, a drone deck on the back where you could, they had this drone that could launch and land in move while moving. 
um, and things like that. So it was an interesting event to see that happen. And then the fact that they came out with the NZT, which they had already announced, like people had already seen it in 2018, the end of 2018, we, we had seen these pictures, but they had shown an actual fully enclosed cabbed UTV. So it's curious to me why they went that route because it's already an $80,000 machine. Is it because that's 80000 they felt like they had to do the enclosure and HVAC and all that stuff? Or was it just them trying to make a statement saying we're different because we can go fully enclosed straight from the factory? Right. Yeah. Not 100% sure. You know, I've talked to um, I've talked to some folks at Nikola, and obviously there's some, you know, one of the first electric vehicles in the sport, power sport market was a motorcycle. And the, the military immediately caught, <clears throat> caught interest of it and trying to get a little bit of feedback as to why they're going towards uh, – why they're going towards electric vehicles, it had nothing to do with, you know, one of the first things that popped in my head is you would do it because it's quiet right. and silent, but that isn't the motivator at all. It had to do with maintenance, you mm. know, it had to do with, you know, there's no belts, there's just less rotating parts. When the, when the machine comes in off of, uh, off of, uh, an operation or something of that nature, it basically, you swap out the battery and it's ready to go again. Right. And that was the big motivator. It had yeah, little that's an interesting idea, right? It's yeah. just, is we, we a lot of times think about the capability, not the functionality, functionality yeah. that goes along with it. Right. And, um, I could definitely see that being a huge thing. And, and the other part of it is, you know, in our heads, we're just used to seeing like in the movies, right? Military operations and they got these, these off-road vehicles and they're out in the jungles or they're out in the deserts doing these things. And the reality of it is, um, most of the deployments of UTVs in the military sense are perimeter, you know, uh, scouting and uh, transportation and things like that. They're not actually out in the heat of battle, taking gunfire, you know, all black ops out and all that stuff. It's, it's usually just the mundane stuff where they have a perimeter to go around. They have transportation from one base to the other. They have materials to go from base to base or whatever. And it's just easier to have a more nimble machine to go straight through the desert versus going right. down these bombed, you know, possibly bombed roads that um, nobody wants to go down. Yeah, don't tell Hollywood that. <laughs> yeah, real life is always less uh, intriguing than, than Hollywood makes it, right? Right after getting the 2019 uh, XP4 Razor, I had the opportunity to go do a snow day with the 509 uh, crew. Um, and just full disclosure for those that, that don't aren't familiar with my background, I worked for 509 for six and a half years. Uh, as their lead developer and was afforded the opportunity to go out with them on a snow day where we um, kind of just at the end of the snow season, the the ski lifts and all that kind of shut down around here. And uh, we can rent out the mountain basically for the day, uh, unobstructed from anybody else on the mountain and go ride the snow machines up on the up on the hills. And uh, I actually elected to take my racer out there and air down the tires. Uh, I think it was around six PSI or so. And uh, actually was able to take that razor all the way to the top of 40, 49 degrees north uh, ski mountain, um, which I honestly never expected to be able to get to the top. It was more of like, I'm going to take it and then take some pictures of it and maybe go up halfway and turn around or get stuck a quarter of the way and be the laughing stock of the crew all day or, or whatever. Right. Uh, but yeah, we made it to the top of the mountain. Um, it was very scenic and beautiful and a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, a lot of guys ask me how that's even possible. They think that, you know, there's no way you did that without tracks or, or whatever. And, you know, the reality of it is, is that at the end of the season, all that snow is packed down to ice and it's, it's pretty crunchy. And as long as you're understanding that there's limits to physics, you know, and you apply your, your method and your talent the right way, you can accomplish a lot of cool things. Right. And so, uh, you know, the reason that I was able to do it was because I was going on the virgin's ice up the mountain. The snow machines hadn't come across yet and broken it up and done all that. So it was pretty crunchy and solid on the top. And there was no way that you'd be able to go up a, a, a track that had already been hit um, and broken that top layer. So the times that I went up, there was always, you know, looking for fresh snow, fresh ice, things that I could grip into. And, and then it was just not, hold, not holding back. Balls to the wall all the way up. Right. Correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't it around March or April or somewhere in there you actually got to take your uh, machine out on a snow-covered golf course? 
<laughs> that's that's true. Yeah, yeah, I totally forgot about that. I know. So I, I live. That's why I'm here, man. <laughs> I live pretty close to a golf course, and uh, they uh, this area over here is is the the water drainage, the natural water drainage through the ground it doesn't exist. It just hits rock and sits there. And so uh, one of our neighbors also had he has a Turbo S, and is friends with the the golf coast uh, course owners and. And they they said, hey, can you bring the machine out and maybe break up some of the snow and ice and, and create some channels of drainage to, to get the golf course clear so we can get an, an earlier season, right? And uh, he invited me out with him. And we just went up and down the fairways and tried to stay off the greens and all that and got to kind of make some, with using the tires to cut channels through the ice and snow to create ways for water to drain out of the golf course. And I think I speak on behalf of every UTV owner in America that uh, <laughs> there, there is a part of us that has that fantasy of going to shred up a golf course. It just seems like ideal riding areas that were... It was definitely just, a bucket list item checked yeah, off for sure. Yeah. Now, I would love to have had it be green and summer, and so I could just go jump, you know, some greens and, and some bunkers and whatnot, but... Bring me that uh, sand trap. <laughs> it was... It was definitely a lot of fun and, and a u- unique opportunity, so I definitely owe Steve a, a great thanks for that. Um, and that's on our YouTube channel. Go check it out at Side by Side Guys um, on YouTube and, and check that out. If that happens again in 2020, I expect a call. <laughs> I don't know how much they're going to appreciate having 50 UTVs show up. <laughs> we'll cut it off at three. <laughs> we'll cut it off. So um, April, um, as far as events go, I didn't really have anything going on, but you got to go to an event on the East Coast. Yeah, I flew out to uh, uh, West Virginia and made the drive down through Kentucky and then into uh, Western Virginia, uh, not West Virginia, but Western Virginia, a little town called Grundy UTV Takeover had an event there that it was kind of linked up into the Hatfield McCoy Trail system. Um, that was a blast. It's a blast. We're going back again this year. Uh, we'll we'll jump into it a little bit more when we get to June. We'll talk about the takeover events because that's when their biggest one uh, falls into place. But uh, it was my first experience on East Coast riding, and I cannot wait to go back. And to be clear, you went there with full throttle I did. to represent uh, uh, that brand. And um, did you get a chance to go actual riding for any amount of time? So uh, because I'm like in the Hall of Fame when it comes to salesmanship, <laughs> there was this dealer there that had a Wildcat 2X. And so I approached him and said that, hey, you know, I, I want to see if our battery will fit in, if I've got an OE battery that will fit into this thing. And so he let me go all over that thing. And I, I basically had made the comment that, yeah, yeah, I've never had a chance to drive with this thing. What, what were your thoughts on it? So then he gave me the keys for the rest of the week. So yay. <laughs> uh, yeah, we uh, we wound up between my coworker and I and our neighbor uh, who was uh, – uh, Taylor Postel from GeForce Offroad. Between the three of us, we took that thing out a number of times, uh, put put a few miles on it, no doubt. And uh, that that event was a blast. It was muddy. We got hit by some uh, kind of freak rainstorms, freak windstorms, and I eat, sleep, and breathe that stuff. Like the more inclement the weather, the more challenges I get when it comes to these sort of rides. The the more more ha- the happier I am with it. Pretty sure I saw an Instagram story of you. In a in a jacket outside in the rain. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Saying say nobody was excited to be standing around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think in 2019 that was actually the only event that I ever that I went to that I actually had cell service. Most of these events are so remote, yeah. either that or they're so big that the network gets clogged. You can't do anything on your cell phone. But this was one of them. It doesn't surprise me that I posted that because. I probably had the ability to. <laughs> that's that's a big thing for these these events is that they're areas that don't typically get more than a you know a couple hundred people oh, on yeah. their cell tower, and then out of nowhere they get five thousand, oh, ten thousand yeah. people on their cell tower or devices, I should say, and they're just completely inundated and unable to efficiently manage the network. Yeah, take over in Coos Bay. If I want to do anything data related, if I want to check email, send an email or something like that, I actually have to hop into my machine and go get on the biggest dune out there. Right. See if you can find a different network or a different tower. Yeah. So that that event for takeover was their first East Coast event, right? That was that was their first venture past the the mid Midwest. Yeah, it was uh, insanely successful. The first couple of days, you know, it started to gather some momentum. But by the last day, uh, I remember the last day I actually left and went down the mountain. And there were trucks, trailers, SUVs, and trailers probably for uh, about a mile all the way down the road. 
where people were dropping off. They're dumping their utility trailer, unloading their machine, heading up the mountain to go check out the vendor row, going on the group rides. And they they did it very similar to the way that they do a lot of the other events. You had uh, you had functions right there at the at the main tent area that were a blast. Anything from car shows to bingo, you name it. Right. Um, they had a mud bog at full throttle sponsored. That was a blast. Um, did very, did something very similar in Sturgis, but, uh, they, you know, they put on such a great event and I'm beyond fortunate to get to be a part of it. So, yeah, definitely a good group of guys that put yeah. that event on. And, and something that people don't understand is a lot of the people that work those events are volunteers and, you know, trail clubs and things like that, that yep. are, are there to support the community and have fun with everybody and make sure everyone has a good time. Right. So right. next time you're at one of those events and, and somebody's flagging you to do something or helping you sign in or do something like that, you know, just tell them, tell them, Hey, thanks for showing up and helping us out. This is a lot of fun. You know, I'd say, you know, there were a lot of highlights when it came to that uh, that event. One of the most memorable things that happened there, though, was uh, uh, one of the one of the people that were, was there pulled out a mason jar and said, uh, this is pure, authentic Kentucky moonshine that came, out, came <laughs> off a mountain three days ago. Would you like some? Yes, I would. <laughs> yeah. It's funny yeah. how how the mason jars show up at these events. Oh, yeah, no, that that was that's kind of I file that away as a unique experience. Like there's probably nothing else that I'm going to be able to do, or something like that would get presented to me. So, and I'm kind of addicted to like Americana type stuff. So yeah. that, I, I'm not. Well, passing we'll that have out. to see if we can't get you out to uh, one of these northern Midwest shows where they bring the apple pie out on on day one. Oh, <laughs> promise, <laughs> absolutely. All right. So moving on into May, I had the opportunity to uh, take a local group of guys. Uh, I didn't take them. I was there with them. Uh, they organized a side-by-side, -side, uh, what they were calling a practice day, at the local uh, motocross park in Airway Heights, Washington. If you have a family or are interested in motorbikes and getting out and having some fun on doubles and tabletops and things like that, I highly recommend uh, checking out the Airway Heights uh, Motocross Park. They have reasonable rates. They have a really great uh, family that runs that operation for the city um, and just to support your local park if you live somewhere else. So, uh, yeah, they, they organize this practice day where you could bring your side by side out and and do all the jumps and, and uh, whoops and all that stuff that normally you wouldn't have access to. Uh, up here in eastern Washington, northern Idaho, we don't have facilities like that for side-by-sides. Like if you go southern Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, Arizona, like there's places where you can go on a track, a dedicated track, and it's the jumps are meant for side-by-sides, the corners are made for side-by-sides, all that stuff. We don't have that up here. No. So the opportunity is to tear up a dirt, tr a dirt bike track, even though it's not the best situation is still a hell of a lot of fun yeah i'd love to get eyes on that too like my only experience with that motocross track is actually on a motocross bike right and i've bled out at that track a few times <laughs> i've uh, left some broken parts out there had some fun but uh yeah i, I definitely want to get out there and check it out watch guys throwing around these machines yeah and my last experience doing it personally because I, I went to the event purely with just the intention of taking photos of these guys out having fun and so it was a it was a different experience for me than the previous time, which I think was in 2017, where I took my four seater turbo um, razor out on a um, it wasn't a poker run, it was a hair scramble, and basically you ride this course that they set up for two hours, and whoever finishes wins basically, and uh, tacoed those radios for odds yeah. pretty hard, and took my machine out pretty quick. So um, Uncle Ben did finish the race. Uh, I think he was second. Um, and, uh, and oddly enough, because all of us guys were out there with X3s and turbos and all such stuff, just going balls to the walls into these just unkept, ungroomed trails. Uh, and pretty much all of us broke something in the yeah. linkage or in, in something. I think some of the guys from Moses Lakes took out their, their front shock towers and stuff like that and their radiators and. It's just money. Uh, it's just money. Uh, but the experience was a hell of a lot of fun. And uh, the people that actually won that scramble was a pair of just little old ladies and a little, uh, was it an 800 or 900? No way. No, I swear to God. Two little old ladies in this little, I, I swear it was an 800, talk but it might have been a 900. You want to talk about going viral? Who has that footage? <laughs> that, that's why I was like, oh, I just want to document this. This is so much fun. These people get to have so much fun out here. Because growing up, we all knew that the tortoise and the hare was BS. <laughs> <laughs> and you got to witness, witness it firsthand. I saw, I saw it firsthand. And, you know, 
by the time it was over, Uncle Ben was covered in mud and he had thrown his goggles off and was just uncomfortable and unhappy. But he had he had the bragging rights of finishing, right? Right. And uh, I think there was a total of three guys. There was a there was a YXZ. I think it was yellow. And that guy from the get go was just bu- out there so fast, so far. You know, what? I know that cut. guy. You do, you yeah, know that guy, Bobby. Is it Bobby Rowland? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he was just so far out. And then at, at like halfway through the race, he he took out a, a, a radius rod or a shock tower or something yep. like that. I can't remember. That's him. <laughs> and uh, and he was so upset because he had put so much work into being in the lead, and then just that one that one mistake or that one corner or what it was i think it was the same thing that killed me it was a it was a double that if you went on the left side you were good if you went slow and you would go up pop your front end over and drop it down pretty hard and if you went on the right side you went up dropped your front end down and then stayed there like it was just that much more deep and uh i went through and i hit it hard and i landed on the pop out with the front end but the back end slammed down into the hole and took my radius rods out and i'm pretty sure that's what took him out too um that hole took out about four of us yeah and, did you uh, notice him uh kind of endoing off jumps with the yxz or was he flying pretty straight you know honestly he got out so far ahead of us yeah that we just lost track of him hey just you know for everybody's confidence too just so you know he's naturally aspirated too <laughs> he didn't need a turbo to get yeah, out in front I mean, of you guys we're t- we, yeah there was a lot of us turbo guys just throwing rocks in each other's faces it's because he, he can turn yeah exactly yeah. and that course was so because it's a motor well so the way they did it was it was the motocross track and they closed half of it off because it just wasn't conducive to utvs and then the rest of it was out in this big field outside of it and there's a trail there but it's not kept it's not groomed it's not maintained it's just there and so when you're hitting it it's lots of tight corners lots of tiny hairpins um uh, lots of little like you know where you're flying and all of a sudden for some reason out of nowhere you dropped into a hole and popped out of it like you just that kind of stuff uh, rocks jetting out things that you just wouldn't normally have to deal with right and um you know that's where he lost us like well i know it was bobby because he was the next day when he was updating his social media he was saying stuff that this particular obstacle took everyone out yeah you know yeah. And, and, I, and he was a victim to it as well so yeah, yeah that doesn't that doesn't shock me <laughs> i think there was a number of small world <laughs> pnw trail riders uh, on that track and, oh, and yeah. i think i think almost all of them uh, were taken out by that yeah. area of the course yeah so uh anyways that was a lot of fun to go out and re to, to revisit that whole concept and to take pictures of these guys flying around the track. And it, this wasn't like that set up. It was just the track, the dirt track, the groom track. Uh, so it was pretty, it was pretty tame, but there was, um, uh, oh man, what's, what's that? Anyways, there was a racer out there. He's like 16, 15, uh, in an RS one, just tearing it up, flying, over every jump, every tabletop, completely over all the way to the bottom, taking every corner at full throttle, like just tearing it up. It was so much fun to, to f- just take pictures of, of people ha- throwing down and having a lot of fun. And he had a mechanical failure? Uh, no, no. So this was just a, a practice day. You weren't out racing anybody. You were just out having fun, practicing your turns, practicing oh, your throttle, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. just just a good day to be out and, and, and tear it up. Yeah, I never raced out there on a dirt bike. I always just went out there to go throw it around and yeah uh, i remember the first time i came out uh, first time i was out there i went went did a couple laps and just like a knucklehead i uh, wasn't didn't have my head on straight and i go into this turner turn and i cut it real shallow and i hook into this rut and i'm just slipping the clutch of coming exiting that turn like yeah. you wouldn't believe because i'm i'm thinking to myself yeah i got about an 80 foot tabletop literally right out of this turn so right. i gotta hit it in second and so i'm so I hit an 80-foot tabletop from a speed standpoint, but by the time I got into the air, I realized it was about a 40-foot. <laughs> yeah, that was the end of my day. Yeah. Flat landed. Yeah. It and uh, ow. <laughs> yeah, pogoed out of that, huh? Yeah, that sucked. <laughs> so anyways, long story short, it's always fun to get out and do something new and different and and, and spread your wings. And it's, it's even more fun sometimes to document it and, yeah. and to watch someone else just have a grin ear to ear. And it's a totally different ride. You know, when you're out there, uh, when you're out there on the dunes or on fire roads and stuff, you have a tendency to be really, really relaxed, really tuned into your machine. Yep. You go onto a track, it doesn't matter if you're racing or just going around, you are wired. Oh like, yeah. You are gripping, you know, sure. I, you have to be ca- cognizant of your grip strength and stuff. You'll start to fatigue out, especially yep. on a dirt bike arm pump up if, if <laughs> you're sure. not used to that sort of stuff. Yeah. So a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So I didn't get to go to any events, but you got a couple uh, 
Yeah, I went to, uh, I flew out to Nashville and uh, went to the Unlimited Off-Road Show. And there was a handful of UTVs there. It's predominantly when you get out there, it's, it's uh, Jeeps. And it was so funny because we were driving into Nashville, and I've got my uh, I've got my DSLR camera sticking out the window, trying to document this trip, and everybody is stopping what they're doing and they're staring at me, and I'm going, what what, what in the heck is this? Is this I got something? I got a, do I got a booger in my nose? Like what's going on here? And then I realized that it was in a uh, I don't know, like a six inch lifted Jeep on 40 inch tires. I'm like, yeah, that probably has something to do with it. That's probably what they're looking at me. But no, I, I going out to seeing more East Coast oriented, seeing the culture, seeing what the riding's like out there. That was so much fun. I mean, when I got home, I was telling everybody and their dog, cancel the trip to Vegas, book a trip to Nashville. That pertains to the, uh, the culture, the overall experience. I just, it was amazing. Yeah, I've always wanted to make my way to Nashville. It's always in, uh, somewhere a place that people talk about just the culture and the people and the way things happen down there seems to always have a good story attached to it. And I, I've always wanted to make my way down there. Everything downtown is mom and pop on one end of downtown. You've got the football stadium on the other end of town. You got the hockey stadium. And in the middle is just this beacon of just country, Western culture, old town vibe. It, it was unbelievable amount of fun. I've, I've never talked to anybody that went out there that, that regretted it. It's, it. I think it's called the bachelorette capital of the world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. So then you flew to the other side of the country. Yeah, I flew to Flagstaff, Arizona to go to uh, uh, Overland Expo West. And if you get a chance to go to that, if you like to go out on these machines, you like to camp, that's a great event because all the new products and stuff, uh, camping support products, uh, they have everything from personal protection down to... Uh, uh, I mean, every winch OE's there, every clothing manufacturer's they have it's stimulus overload if you do go. And it that event hits, I want to say, in the first couple of weeks of May. Bring the warmest clothes you own. Yeah. And you wouldn't think that in Arizona. It yeah, is Flagstaff, brutal. Flagstaff's a lot like our neck of the woods yeah. where it's it's high altitude, lots of trees, cold at night. Dude, first day, I think the high was about 46. Yeah. The wind hit 50. Um, second day... It was about 78 with minimal amount of wind. But once the sun went down, it was really cold. Yeah. And then the next day, it was just as brutal as the, the rest. It was somewhere around 50 degrees, got a little bit of rain. Um, so, yeah, if you're going to go to that event, prepare, prepare for anything. But yeah. in terms of getting your eyes on some products that are uh, that are available, I just... It, that, a lot of those custom Overlander uh, builders show up to that show everyone, too, right? Like everyone. those huge monster yep. earth mover mm -hmm. trucks that they convert into off it's Overland called, trucks. Yeah, uh, they're actually an OE of ours. It's oh. uh, Earth Cruiser. Yeah, 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 yeah. Th those are pretty amazing machines. They're incredible. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, it looks like something that you could tackle uh, like a military application. It, and there's a yeah. lot of that at Overland don't hate me but when it pertains to overland it really kind of placates I, I know i know i've said this in the past but it really speaks to the inner gear hoarder that we all have in us <laughs> and uh and there's no shortage of tactical timmies at an overland convention <laughs> you know so that was something that was pretty apparent but no i had a blast there it's just and and, and the reason we're touching on this because it's not directly utv related but utv in the overland market is starting to take off it's starting to gather right, a lot yeah. of momentum yeah and i see that trend really continuing yeah for sure and people are going to see that you know as long as you're you're willing to give up a few things, you can gain a lot of things by going a UTV route versus a truck route. Yeah, and you can go to a lot more um, unique places that you wouldn't be able to go to in a in a full size you know truck. Yeah, you're not going to be able to haul the amount of gear that you normally would, like in your Toyota, your Bronco, or something like that. But you're going to be able to go down the trail faster. You're in a tougher rig too. You are. I mean, if you're going 25 miles an hour down some of these trails in an F-150, that thing's going to rattle apart, whereas a UTV, it's not even stretching its legs at that right. point. It's just nothing. Your payload, yeah. you know, just makes so much of a difference when you're talking about overlanding. And yeah, you're going to weigh down your machine with all the stuff you need to bring, but it still doesn't even pale in any comparison to a full-size truck completely right. loaded. So, right. And I've gone out and done some of these overland trips like on my Yamaha YXZ, and uh, the way that I factor in mileage is I've actually verified a mile on my odometer, and my odometer was accurate even though I, you know, I switched tires and I verified, re-verified it. So I know, knew how to do the math between fuel that I consumed versus the mileage on my odometer. And uh, you know, even factoring in maybe like a 3 to 5% error, uh, my Yamaha was getting somewhere in the ballpark on the low side of 18, on the high side about 26 miles per gallon, depending on the conditions. And there isn't a vehicle on the planet that's going to get that in the mountains. 
Not, UTV, not off road. Not no. off road. Not off road. And another thing to consider too is like Toyotas. Most Toyotas have like a gas tank that's like fourteen gallons, maybe sixteen right. gallons, up to eighteen. Whereas my Yamaha had a nine point five. My Can Am's got a ten point five. Right. So in theory, when you're off road like that, you're going to be able to go further. Right. Now with the with the understanding that you're going to be in the throttle a lot more because you're going to be having a lot more fun than you would have in that truck. A lot more fun. <laughs> so yeah. so your fuel consumption uh, probably is is going to be all over the charts depending on how For you sure. ride. Uh, to wrap up uh, May, we also had uh, Tanner Godfrey uh, breaking the long jump record in the UTV once again. So he had previously held a 223-foot uh, jump record. It was at some sort of um, Evil Knievel days that he had set that. Uh, but then he uh, he was on part of the, one of the Diesel Brothers shows where they had a whole bunch of stuff going on. And one of the things that they had going on was this, this record long jump where he jumped 247 feet. Uh, in his razor. And if you don't know who Tanner Godfrey is, uh, he's a uh, disabled uh, uh, athlete who had a, b- a big wreck, I believe, is what killed his back and, and took out his legs or whatever. Um, I think it was on a dirt bike or something in the dunes. Uh, I'll have to revisit it and, and, and get for that down for sure. But um, he, he basically doesn't have use of his legs. He's now to a point, if you go check, follow his social media, he's to a point where he's walking around and he just got married. Congratulations, Tanner. Um, and so he drives one hand on the steering wheel, one hand on a cane that pushes the throttle and the brake. So he's not throttling with his foot. He's not braking with his foot. He's doing it singly with a cane. It's not a lever system built into the steering column or anything like that. It's literally him with a stick pushing the gas pedal and pushing the brake pedal. And this guy sets long jump records in, wow. a, in a razor. So I encourage you to go check him out. He's a unique guy. He has a lot of cool uh, content uh, and he's not afraid to, to, th- to send it. Yeah. Guys that have stories like that is really interesting. I know Jesse Nelson has one as well. Jesse Nelson is a uh, factory uh, factory Polaris rider. He used to be factory KTM Supercross rider and he had a horrible accident in the Supercross race a number of years ago. But um, if you check out his Instagram, you can see kind of the content they're developing. He's just, he is one heck of a driver. And I I think he's operating with hand controls as well. Yeah. It seems like these athletes that go from an extreme sport to being disabled seem to use that as just a platform to go even further. And uh, it's props to those guys for sticking into it and and making sure that they can um, keep up with the rest of us and, and send it past us. Right. All right, so going into June, um, you know, there was a lot of riding going on. <laughs> we got a lot of trail riding in under our belts in June uh, and July, uh, mostly in northern Idaho, uh, just because it's a quick jaunt over for us. We don't have to invest a lot into gas and all that stuff. But um, yeah, so one of our more popular starting points is Fourth of July Pass in north Idaho. And uh, I took my buddy out with me. It was one of the few times I went out either by myself as far as single machine or um, with not the family and things like that. And I took my buddy with me and we had a, a good day. The intention was to film some uh, product review videos up in the mountains, um, but that ended up being thwarted by some weather. And so we decided eh, we'll just ride and have a great time. And um, we had a whole day. We rode 90 plus miles um, that day. And uh, there was almost nobody out in the mountains. It was great. Um, but, you know, uh, sometimes fate has different plans for you. And um, uh, one of the things that we had been avoiding all day were tree falls from spring where the trees had come down off the side of the trail and then were protruding into the trail as arrows trying to kill you. Um, and uh, all day had been avoiding them, no problems. And then the very last point... I think it was 0.8 miles to the load up zone. We snagged one of those up through the firewall, came straight in through the lower uh, quarter of the the razor through the through the floorboard where the the pan and the firewall meet, and went straight in front of my shins and stopped at the shifter. So was it an elevated branch or was it on the ground and it got kicked up by driving it over driving over it? Yeah. So a lot of the tree falls are either top hanging off the top of the the side of the mountain and then pointing towards the ground or they're on the ground and either get kicked up into your suspension or or whatever. This one actually was halfway on the sidewall of the mountain and was literally sticking straight out horizontally into the path. So it snuck up on you. It snuck up on it for sure. Well, what actually happened was 
we were going about 30, 34 miles an hour, somewhere in that range. I think I, I want to say it was 34 miles an hour and just hit a rock. It bumped the back end out just a little bit enough where you had to correct it. And when I corrected, um, the focus was on correction and not falling off the trail and not what was on the trail. Right. And in that moment, the perfect storm happened where that tree sticking out hit the fender well and then slid in as we were mo- moving forward and through the firewall and grazed the front of my shins and stopped at the shifter on the on the razor. So you know where the shifter is in the middle center column and where the firewall is above your, your dead pedal. You know, that's the path that traveled and where we ended up stopping the the tree came in and then hit the frame eventually as we were moving forward and then snapped off and then that part of the tree went into the um, lower half doors that I have um, UTV ink um, steel lower half doors proceeded to crease those in half and travel up my thigh and then stop where my rib cage would have been and um, I have some pictures and I'll throw them up uh, on the video side. So if you're not watching and you're listening, go check us out on YouTube and watch it. No shortage um, of horror stories when it comes to this. It's, yeah. it's something everybody has to be cognizant of when you're driving in the mountains. And I won't lie. I mean, I've, I've talked about it to a lot of people before it ever happened to me as, yeah. you know, something you should always be careful and for look sure. out for. And then you expect it to never happen to you. Yeah. I tell people when I'm riding with them, I, I basically tell them that I avoid branches like the plague. Right. Of any size. Like if I see it, you know, fortunately, uh, thank God, like I have uh, like roughly about 20, 20 vision. So my eyes are down trail substantially. And like when I see loose branches and stuff on the trail, I deliberately try to avoid them as much For as sure. possible. And you're always, you know, you're driving ahead of where you're at. You're yeah. never driving in front of where you're at. And, you know, it was one of those things where we got out. We're like, holy crap, that just happened. Right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, the first picture that I showed here is is me taking my phone out of my pocket, looking straight down to my legs and taking a picture to make sure that they were still there. Yeah. Like I understood what had happened. The the thought in my head was this could be bad. So I wanted to make sure I was OK before I even moved um, just because of the sheer like adrenaline running through my body. And then we were able to jump out and take pictures of everything and, and make sure we were OK. But looking at the aftermath of that, you know. It, it really, it was a, a pivotal moment in my journey in side-by-side and off-roading and all that, where it was, you always talk about how the end or the, the game changer thing or the whatever is always around the corner to other people. You never talk to or think about it to yourself. And then when it happens to you, you're always caught off guard. And you can talk, you can talk to other people about it all you want, but unless you're actually thinking and realizing it in your life, it's never going to be as real until it happens. Sure. And so, you know, I count my blessings to understand that how fortunate I was that that did not go into my legs or into my, if as it traveled up the side of the door, if I didn't have those lower doors, that would have impaled my thigh. It would have went it straight up into my rib cage, you know, all that. And if that tree was at any sort of any upward angle and not to a point where it was horizontal with the machine, that would have went straight up into my rib cage. And we're not talking about like a, small little branch, right? This thing is four inch plus. four inches, yeah. And the part that went through the firewall and snapped off, I have in my garage as a souvenir, as a reminder that at any moment, no matter how good you think you are, it could change. Right. I wasn't going down a hard trail. I wasn't going down faster than I should have been. I wasn't doing something stupid. It was just coincidence that that rock was there at that moment in time next to that tree and that I overcorrected. Right. And not to go too far off script here, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't the new XP Pro, the RZR Pro, come out with um, a skid plate or something uh, in the the wheel well there to kind of essentially acknowledging that that's a reality and it's a problem? Yeah. So something that any Polaris owner will tell you is that 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 whole lower tub and firewall is, is so unfortunately exposed and shaped that it's almost meant to catch trees. It's almost meant to kept catch those impaling objects because of the way that the the dead foot the dead pedal is a- angled it's molded into the pan and so it becomes a catch point because there's a frame rail that goes underneath it and once something enters that pocket it's impossible for it to come out unless you've stopped moving and so um we've always talked in the in the razor community about how they should have 
firewall guards and floor pan guards and skid plates and all and the necessity for all those things. And being someone that's had razors for multiple years, I've always said I should have a skid plate. I should have some sort of protection under there. And I just never got around to it. It was never a priority. And that kind of just reiterated the fact that it is a priority. Whole new appreciation. Yeah. And so when the pros came out, they did have a firewall, a second layer firewall, uh, you know, um, surround around that that goes down to the pan and then the pros have a skid plate on them that goes full length. Uh, whether those are, you know, durable enough to take those kinds of impalements, I'm not sure. I haven't tested it to a point like I would know that. Uh, but it's there and it's not going to create the pocket and it's not going to create the catch-all and it's not going to be the, the hazard that it was. So that's a huge step forward in the Polaris side. Now, that being said, that's only the pro. That's not the XP turbos. That's not the Turbo S. That's not the XP 1000s. That's not the 900s. They all have that problem. Yeah, and I'll never operate under the assumption that I'm safe just because there's a skid plate there. It's just when you see that that loose hanging bran- loose hanging branches or any sort of intrusion like that, right. you've got to show some respect. Yeah, and and just to be clear, there I've seen branches go up through skid plates. Like, yeah, they're not absolutely. the solve all, right? Yeah, and I would expect it to. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, you're you're putting physics into play that you just don't have control over yeah. at that point, and and they're going to do what they're going to do. Um, I've seen so many impalement pictures on on Facebook groups. I've seen so many videos of people just not paying attention to the surroundings and getting caught on things. Um, and so it's just a good. It was a good reminder um, to me personally as a as a driver, but also to everyone I can now influence through my voice to say. Take it into consideration. It's always a possibility. Always be prepared. Don't do stupid things. Know what you're driving. Don't go beyond your skill level. You know, and even like in my situation, I wasn't driving beyond my skill level. I was well below it on a well-groomed trail. You know, it was just a coincidence that it all came together that way. You know, and it's not shocking that it happened in June because June is usually where people in the northern Idaho area start to take to the trail because that's, you know, depending on the year and especially last year, that's when things started to get passable. Yeah. So if you're if you're one of the first people on those trails, you got to take into consideration that, that that's And that's potential. not only a trail thing either. I mean, that's the desert. That's East Coast. Oh, for sure. That's South. Yeah. That's everywhere. There's, there's things in, that you can and cannot see that will do things to your machine and to you that you just will never have a, any preparedness for until it happens. Right. So just uh, just a PSA for all our watchers and listeners to just take that reminder, keep it in the back of your subconscious, and just always know when you go out, be prepared for the worst and know how to handle it. A few things happened in June besides that. Um, I got an opportunity, again, driving North Idaho. We got to drive up to the top of a mountain and watch the 4th of July fireworks, um, which was a really cool experience because you could see, I think we could see three different cities all shutting off their uh, fireworks. Uh, And there's a whole bunch of people up there having a good time, hanging out, bonfire. Um, It was just a really good experience uh, to, to get out and try something different. Uh, so that's something I always encourage is try something different, something new. And uh, for the 4th of July, we said, hey, why are we sitting on the grass in a park with 10,000 people? Let's go try to do something um, different. And uh, we planned for it, went out and had a great time. Was there a hole in your firewall while you went out there uh, <laughs> towards? Or with... that, that was, yes. I had actually stitched up the hole in the firewall with a bunch of zip ties. You weren't Fred Flintstoning it? Uh, it felt like it. Yeah. I mean, subconscious was there for sure. <laughs> Uh, but the one thing that I would also take into consideration if you're thinking about maybe doing 4th of July fireworks on a mountain is uh, understand that you're not getting back to camp <laughs> anytime soon. And we weren't dressed for the weather at that point. And pretty chilly. it was a pretty cold ride yeah. back. So to continue into the industry news, Honda released their four-seater talons in July or in June. Sorry, um, They released their 1000X4 and their 1000X4 live valve edition, which um, caught me way off guard. Uh, I didn't realize that uh, the live valve technology was out of um, embargo on the licensing. And uh, they brought the Dy- Polaris Dynamics type suspension to a different vendor. Uh, so now, now Polaris has a uh, competition in that realm. Uh, Honda's got their live valve edition, and from what I've been told, it's a pretty slick setup. It works really well. Um, I believe the the Honda version has only uh, three settings. Um, I think on that, uh, but um, they weren't uh, 
at least Polaris is not alone. There's competition now in the live valve space in the UTV market. Yeah, hopefully that's a trend. I would love to see all the OEs offer that. Yeah, for sure. And um, just the fact that Honda put a four-seater out shortly after releasing their two-seaters just means and reiterates that they're in for the long haul. They're in there to to take over some market share and, and be competitive. So that was nice to see. And then right after Honda's uh, announcement, Can-Am had their 2020 model releases come out and surprised everybody with their 195 horsepower uh, Turbo RR models um, that goes across their uh, XMR series, their um, RC series, and their XRS and the RS series. Yeah. yeah. So, um, 195 horsepower. They upgraded a lot of the components of the top end. They they increased the turbo size and um, the internals of the motor was changed out. Injectors. Yeah, they kind of just beefed everything up. Yeah. Um, they didn't really change the motor uh, displacement or anything like that. They just kind of beefed everything up to handle the additional horsepower. And uh, I think even the the crankshafts and all that stuff got beefed up too. So yeah, you touched on uh, earlier about how 2016 was kind of a pinnacle year for the industry, where there was a lot of news coming out. You know, you had the uh, 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 Yamaha and X3, and the Can-Am X3 came to the market. But I would say since then, 2019 had some news. I, I think that really kind of shook things up that people got people excited. And I would say the two biggest things that I've noticed was the release of the RR models and the Kawasaki. People went nuts when those things were coming out. It seemed to be dominating every thread, every Facebook page, known to man. So, right, yeah. It was, so it was in June, deal. we started hearing rumors of the the KRX starting to come to fruition and and all that. So, uh, yeah, the, the the 195 horsepower, you know, that whole concept of breaking 200 horsepower from OEM is becoming more and more of a reality. You know, it was only a few years ago where um, the thousands were the only option and they were at a hundred and, uh, or, or they were at 95 horsepower and then they jumped up to 110, and then the turbos came out and then those jumped up another 30 horsepower. And, and now we're to a point where the top dogs at 195 and, uh, pushing the limits on what you can do with the small displacement engines that they, that they have. And right. Right. I think people are finally getting, uh, getting the hint too that, uh, these machines, you know, you got to show them some respect. Um, there's no shortage of stories of people going out, buying a brand new RZR Pro, buying a brand new Can-Am X3, buying it from a dealer that's close proximity to say some dunes or something of that nature. And they'll go out there and they'll take off in them. And 20 minutes later, they are totaled. Right. They're totaled. I mean, these machines, you know, if you're coming from something like quads or motocross, there is a learning curve. And if you're new to duning, there's a huge learning curve. So, you know, it's just one of those things where uh, as these things start to increase and increase in horsepower as an enthusiast, it's going to be great for us. But it also you, you have to you know, you're just not going to be able to jump into one of these things and have an expectation that you're going to be able to handle it, you know. There's, like I said, I couldn't tell you how many times I see guys rolling off of the side of mountains and stuff in a brand new Turbo S, and to come to find out they were in two wheel drive, and they're right. out there with their family. I have no business, you know. Like, <laughs> that's yeah. just a recipe for failure. Yeah, buying the capability doesn't mean you're capable. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And it's only a matter of time before you know the in, these, the auxiliary industries start reflecting some of these decisions, like the insurance industry. You know, it's only a matter of time before those rates start to become something that actually impact your pocketbook versus being so cheap as they are now. Right. Um, you know, everybody's always looking for the best deal. They're always on the in the forums asking, where are you getting your stuff insured at? I want a cheaper rate, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, OK, at some point, there's going to be enough claims and enough stupid people out there to create an impact on the insurance industry. And it's going to become just as much as your car's insurance. And, and guess what's going to happen when those insurance rates become unattainable? Banks are going to stop loaning on them, mm -hmm. and it's going to go away the same way the three-wheeler did. Yep. And it's just going to, you know, in the event that something like that happens, it's going to tick the guys like me off because of these knuckleheads that are going out. I use the term knucklehead because that's what it is. Pretty, you pretty know, accurate. Yeah. I mean, if you're going out into the mountains and you're driving, thinking that you're Tanner Faust out there rallying through these mountain trails and you're out there in two-wheel drive, you're going to have an accident. <laughs> or trying to do donuts in four-wheel yeah, drive or just yeah. a, a number of different things that you just don't think about as a new driver. Oh, just, I mean, like within the last 24 hours, there was a guy uh, in my hometown, he was doing donuts in a gravel parking lot. And once his rig started to tip, he put his foot out the door. Broke oh his, just shattered his leg. You know, oh what gosh. are you thinking? <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, and also just, it's not just the driver. 
it's the passengers. Yeah. And the passengers, nine times out of 10, are just along for the ride. They have no experience. They have no uh, history driving off road or in dangerous situations or situations where you have to keep your limbs in the vehicle or, you know, things like that. And so the natural tendency is to brace yourself. Right. And um, I know people that have lost limbs because they were with somebody and they rolled and they put their arm out yep. or, or whatever it is um, or grabbed the cage, you know, for stability and lost their fingers. Yep. Um, so These things are highly capable. And if you disrespect them, they will bite you. For sure. And in and, and, and every angle, like it's yep. not just one thing or another or just it, it's everything. Like yeah. you, everything comes up for debate at that point and that machine's going to win. Yeah. I mean, I've thrown guys, you know, uh, as it coming from motocross, the first time people hop onto a high performance motocross rig or something like, uh, that's probably about the last bike that should be your first leg over a motorcycle as right. a high performance motocross bike. It was mine, but I also respected the heck out of it. Right. You know, and, and I think people have a little bit more confidence based on the fact that it's on four wheels, but that doesn't mean anything. I mean, well, you it's go that cage, right? Yeah, you think I mean, that you, cage is going to do everything for well, you. Well, and if, I mean, if you're on loose gravel or something, it doesn't matter how many wheels are down. So, right. So, um, yeah, the, the high hope performance is here to stay, I think, and we're going to see more of it and hopefully the industry and the community adapts, uh, correctly. All right. Um, and then we had another event, UTV takeover, um, Coos in Bay. Coos Bay. Yeah. Yeah, that is uh, UTV Woodstock right there. That is, um, I want to say somewhere between uh, 15,000 to upwards of maybe 30,000 people converging on the uh, sand dunes in, uh, I, I call it like south, uh, well, it's it, it's in western Oregon, Coos Bay, look it up on Google Maps. Uh, they have a, there's a, a dunes, or I'm sorry, uh, a sand dune park there that uh, hosts UTV Takeover. There's so much content on YouTube relating to that event, and if you have the means to get to that event, I have yet to be to want, be at any event that rivals that. Yeah, it is a lot of fun. The the events at um, Coos Bay and at Winchester Bay, I consider those kind of like the Pebble Beach of UTV, where yeah. it's like you can't get better scenery for a UTV event than the Oregon coast. Right, and um, it, it may be windy most of the time it may be a little bit chilly a lot of the time but for for just being out and having an experience it's so beautiful yeah. it's so scenic and then you have the sand dunes which is just an amazing experience in itself and then you have the community there doing all these events and um competitions and showing off and all this other stuff it's just a great mix of everything that makes utv awesome right and uh, really encourage people to check out uh the the oregon utv takeovers it's a great event yeah. Yeah. Some of the feedback on that event as well as you've got, um, uh, you got a bunch of people converging on us, you know, and they're going to, they're going to say it's a small space and that you have to contend with a lot of traffic. I mean, there's some realities there. You definitely have to make sure you're staying to the right, make sure you're being aware of people that are oncoming and stuff. But, you know, I, I hear some feedback along the lines that, uh, you kind of run out of some space to ride and that, sure. that could not be any further from the truth. I mean, any, anybody, can look on Google Maps and see that entire play area around Coos Bay. There are areas of that, especially as you start to head back to the ocean, you can just disappear. You won't see another machine. Right. There might be 20,000 people out on the sand and you can disappear from all of them. You know, I, I guess the only thing that I would really advise people, if, if you're not really into exploring, if you see tire tracks, you're probably safe. You know, it's one of those things I always tell people when it comes to dunes, especially if they don't have a lot of experience with dunes, is don't break trail. Don't break trail. Don't go exploring where you don't see tire tracks and stuff because you might run into a witch eye. You might fall off a dune or something and have an accident. But if you if you see tracks, somebody else has gone through that. You know? Right. So it's probably one way or the other. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but, it, usually that that opinion of running out of room typically revolves around the idea that there's this one thing that you want to do, oh but everybody gosh. else wants to do it too. Yeah, you see that everywhere. You see it at Glamis with Oldsmobile Hill. You see it uh, uh, You see it at Winchester Bay with Banshee Hill. So those, these people can basically convene into this one small space, and then they think that there's nowhere else to go ride. And, that the, the, the and then everybody's is, mad at each other for yeah. taking turns out of order and things like that. It's yeah. Just, Meanwhile, I'm out having the time of my life, and right. I don't see another machine for miles. Yeah. The, the tip I usually give people is look at where everybody is and then go to the opposite side. Yeah. Like just go to the other side of the park yeah. and then come back when that thins out. Yeah. Now a good rule of thumb in Oregon too, is if you're heading South, be careful. Yeah. If you're heading North, pretty in good shape. Yeah. You know, that's that tends, you know, based on kind of wind direction and stuff, the, um, the, the, the steepest drop-offs tend to be as you're headed South. Right. 
So at this event, uh, I believe Al Macbeth set a new sand jump record this year. Yeah. Um, I don't remember exactly how far it was. I think it was like 133 feet, something like that. All I know is when he went over my head, he was at about 25 to 35 feet, somewhere in that ballpark. I was, I was right there. And I was filming it, and I was filming it in 120 frames per section, second, which is slow-mo. And as somebody's approaching a jump and you hit that record button. Oh, yeah. When you play that back, it could be 30 to 40 seconds of nothing happening. Well, I was going so fast that he hit that. I caught him in the air. Right. And I still got half the jump, but it was just, it was from another world, man. It was so clean, too. You should have heard that crowd. Yeah. That crowd was, I mean, there was was people going nuts and applauding it, but more more or less, people were just blown away. They're like, did that just really happen? Well, because it was happening at an event called Huckfest, right? Oh, yeah. And so you have every known... (laughs) redneck out of the backwoods and every type of car and every everything trying to jump as far as they can and not kill their machines oh, yeah. themselves yeah and then you have al come out at the end and and just tear it up yeah yeah and he uh you know when he hit that jump uh utv takeovers host don i think don's reaction to it was what the heck just happened <laughs> yeah if like, you watch what? the video you can hear him he's just like <laughs> did anyone just see that <laughs> like what was that yeah it was it was pretty remarkable it was a pretty awesome jump and yeah. super clean and he throttled feathered that throttle right at the right time and landed perfectly flat and as clean as that is i can tell you and you, you ask al those landings at that type of distance is just your They're body serious. your body can put up with it or it's gonna break yeah. you know and there was a guy and i uh, uh i think it was cole friday uh he was in an X3 and he flat, you know, he, he t- placed second and he collapsed out of his car after that thing had landed. It flat right. landed. I think he broke his back, you know. Whereas yeah, I mean, you, you got to remember car, that. Al's car is set up to do Yeah, this. I was going to say, you have to remember yeah. that Al's car is purposely built yep. to jump. Yeah. Like not just jump, like to go to the dunes and have fun, like jump, jump, yeah. big jumps, flat landings, jump. If we could ever do an episode and just feature a ride that's the car. <laughs> that car is so cool. Yeah, I go to his page and check that out. I mean, it's been featured in magazines. Oh, it's, yeah. oh just nuts. So, uh, but that's one reason why I, I don't do flat landing jumps anymore because I understand, I have the self-awareness to know that my body won't take that landing anymore. Yeah. So I won't do those big jumps without a rolling landing or anything like that. Yeah. So um, it's it's definitely a different breed of person that can do that. And it's a different uh, pocketbook that can do that because it's a purpose built. I stretched machine. out about 150 feet, 150 feet plus on a dirt bike, and I'm good. I don't need to, I don't need to do it in a side by side, man. It's, yeah. it's sketchy enough on a dirt bike that has a, you know made to do stuff like that. Right. Yeah. And and there's still quite a bit of talent involved in that. So. Oh, tons of talent. Tons of talent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so in July, uh, the the takeover events continued, and along with some other events. Um, did you get to go to any of those? Yeah, I got to go to Sturgis. Uh, UTV Takeover held an event at Sturgis. It was just outside of town at the Full Throttle. Hey! The uh, Full Throttle Saloon. Um, so that, you know, the, the, the main riding area was quite a ways away. You had to drive down a highway, and it was, was totally fine. You had to go into Sturgis, and you had to leave town and go towards Deadwood. And that's where the main riding area was. The main trail systems uh, were out in that neck of the woods. So the the off road rally was right there at the Full Throttle Saloon. They had every a uh, bunch of vendors set up. They had a rally course. It was it was a blast. Uh, Al did a jump out there. Um, there was a mud bog out there. So there's a lot going on. Um, I gotta say though. Uh, that was some of the best riding I've ever been on. You know, the the off-road trail systems out there. It's the only thing that I've ridden on that was comparable to that in terms of how beat up and tore up it was, was the Washington backcountry route. Like Washington trails are toast. You know, I, I don't know if it's just that Washington doesn't take care of them enough, but uh, those trails out there in uh, Sturgis were, they were no joke. They were really rough. There was a hill climb up there that uh, still to this day, I'll never forget it. Like I had to back down it and I was about to go over backwards. It was so steep. Um, we had a blast, you know, the event itself for a first year event, you know, there's always a little bit of kind of a gray area as to, as to what to expect, you know, and Sturgis, obviously from where, where we are at right now, Sturgis is about a thousand miles away. So we don't have the benefit of getting a lot of the traffic off I-5, you know, people from Seattle, people from Portland probably aren't going to venture that far out, but, um, it was, it was a lot of fun. The riding out there was great. Did you get to do Rally in the Pines this year? Rally in the Pines, we went out there. I did it as kind of a supporting vendor. Uh, 
I think my goal was to put on about 300, 350 miles while I was there and, and got very close, you know, and, it, and rally in the pines was in a new location this year, right? Uh, or was it's it's been in the same year? location the last two years. It was okay. Outside, last year they yeah, moved it. Yeah. It was outside of Sam and Idaho. And when we would leave for rides on the first, the first time we went to rally, when we leave for rides, I told those guys, I'm like, we're not even going to remotely entertain turning around until we've got about 120 miles on, right. you know, that was the minimum. And we never quite hit it that far because it would just get too late in the day. And, right. Um, Especially but, as a vendor. For sure. For sure. But uh, Rally in the Pines is a great event for vendors because you're at the booth from eight to five. And then from there, just tear up the mountain. I mean, there were times we got off the mountain about three in the morning. Uh, the same with Sturgis. You know, there, there, I doubt there's too many people that could tell you they are the last ones to walk out of the full throttle <laughs> saloon at Sturgis. I am that guy. I, I was the last person to exit that place. And I was thinking to myself, it's like, I think it was like 2.30 in the morning or something. And we were working the entire time, yeah. working the entire day. And uh, uh, rallying the pines can be like that as well. You know, the the trails out there are cut so great. You know, the Forest Service roads that, you know, if you've got, Idaho's pretty good on yeah, the trails. Yeah, if you've got the light, you can uh, really have a lot of fun out there. But I got into some more of the technical trails this year. The first year, it was more or less going 65 down some of the, as those roads opened up, and it was safe to do so. This year, we went down some of the uh, the tighter stuff, some of the rough, rougher stuff. And uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was a great event. A lot of fun. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I went to Dune. We actually met at Dune Fest. Did you get to go to Dune Fest this year? No, it went off at the exact same time as uh, TakeOver oh, in okay. Sturgis. Yeah. Uh, Dune Fest, if you haven't been there, uh, is in Winchester Bay, Oregon. Great event. Um, it's one of the biggest events Oregon does on the dunes. Um, and so they basically uh, shut down the dunes and make it into a entire event uh, area. They have everything from Vendor Row to uh, freestyle shows. All the big vendor trailers are there for uh, test rides and things like that. So you can go out and try the newest machines. Um, there's a bunch of auxiliary vendors out on the sand as well. And then there's a ton of camping out on the sand. So if you're into that kind of stuff, um, feel free to bring your truck and trailer out there. There's unlimited space basically for you to camp out there. So yeah, <clears throat> Winchester Bay currently as it pertains to all the places that I've ridden, Winchester Bay is my favorite. It is. If you want hills, they got it. You want, uh, you want bulls, they got it. You want trails, they got it. It's small. But in terms of uh, going for like a three day ride, I just that's my de facto. I just yeah. I love it out there. It's so much fun. I've been I've been wanting ever since I've been out to that event. I've been wanting to get into the hills. Yeah. outside of there, um, and everybody says it's great riding out there. And so uh, looking forward to maybe having that opportunity this next summer. Absolutely. Yeah. There's some. There, I I think part of it is. Too that I, I know quite a few lines out there that can be pretty exhilarating. You know, we've got some lines where you got to drop off into a dune that's at a 45 degree angle. And if you short it, you're going into water. If you right. land it perfectly, you go down into a step down area that you're going to get turned around in. And when you lead a group, a large group of cars into an area like that, uh, the best thing to do is to get to the bottom of it, turn around real quick and kill the motor so you can hear guys screaming as they're going up because they didn't see it coming. But yeah, a lot of fun. As far as, uh, uh our product reviews and stuff, I put out a uh, review of the Pro Armor 4 steering wheel. Go check that out on our website or on YouTube. I also got a chance to ride uh, up at the Cutthroat Resort by the, on the St. Joe River. Uh, so uh, that's on the um, lower side of North Idaho. Um, and speaking of trails, like if you are a rider that does not like bumpy rides, like if you want it to be smooth and relaxing and you just want to look at all the pretty stuff, that's where to go like those trails there are so well done they are like chip sealed and like dusted off and like i i could probably eat off of those trails they are so nice and uh so if you're into scenic wonders and tunnels and creek beds and all that kind of stuff go check those trails out they are so smooth and so pretty there's a lot of fly fishing down in that area if i remember it, there's a right ton too. of fly fishing yeah, there's, there's a lot of barb list put back type fishing but there's a ton of fly fishing opportunities up there and it's just creek after creek for days like it just it just doesn't stop that's cool so check that out all right so as far as uh new vehicles in in uh july polaris released both their ranger 1000 crew 1000 and their razor pro xp all in july so there was a lot going on there um, the Ranger 1000 was kind of a mellow release, but it's kind of an important release, in my opinion, because it's replacing the 900. 
So in the lineup of the Polaris Rangers, you know, you would have the, I think the 570, the 900, and then the XP 1000. And so they introduced the 1000, the non XP 1000, and they had a lot of upgrades that come from the XP 1000 down to the price point of the 900 without having to invest the extra $5,000 into the XP. So if you're into the Ranger working UTV class, like, that is a huge win for you to not have to have that compromise of the 900 engine and have the power you need and the torque you need uh, without all the bells and whistles of the XP. Right. So um, good job there for Polaris. And then they, you know, the big game changer that everybody was talking about this year, the, the Polaris Pro XP came out. That's kind of a, a game changer for Polaris. It's not necessarily a game changer for anyone else. Uh, I think they were hoping it was. Um, but they didn't really come out with anything new and different outside of the fact that they came out with a single piece chassis, a stiffer chassis, um, better uh, shock placement, things like that. And, you know, created a lot of controversy on the looks. You know, the I don't think I've ever seen such an uproar about a UTV's looks. For me, it all came down to the doors. Because I, I see guys that'll change to an aftermarket doors and everybody loves the way it looks. That was literally the only uh, critical factor that I could see on the car. And I mean, it didn't bug me. I have no problem with the car at all. I've hopped into it and it's comfortable. Very right. comfortable car. I think it's an interesting idea, though, going back to the conversation about the impalement um, scare we had, right. that the new door design is essentially a full door. It has a hole in the side of it, but it's it's at the back. Right. And it's essentially a full door. And I think that's them recognizing that the, the consumer market's saying it's it's not worth the price if you're not willing to put the extra little bits in. Um, and so seeing them do that, the firewall uh, skid plates and all that kind of stuff, it, it was a big win for the consumer market because I foresee every model after that also adopting those changes right. and, and all that. So, right. um, yeah, there, we could go on for days about the Pro XP and, and the controversy around the looks and all that stuff. But uh, it was a pivotal point for Polaris to put that stick in the sand and say that we're moving forward off of our old designs. Uh, you know, get get used to it. <laughs> as picky as people want to get it about how that looks, I have yet to find somebody that has complained about how it handles. For sure. And that's what you want. So um, I know that there is a little bit of... Um, discussion around the clutches um, and the programming at high RPM. Uh, but I believe that we'll probably see that kind of dwindle out a bit over time. As well, I think that was it. on cars that were produced prior to the end of September. Anything that was made later after that, I think had been updated. Maybe there was a bug and they just yeah. fixed it. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure that working with your local dealer, you'll get that, that figured out. Just do it within the first six months. There you go. All right. And so... August was a big month for, for some of us. Yeah, um, yeah. Not so much for me, but for you guys uh, on your neck of the woods, you guys did a lot. Yeah, uh, I guess we'll start with like UTV Invasion. So UTV Invasion uh, is an event out at St. Anthony. It was the last year that they're going to be hosting an event out at St. Anthony, which reason I'm leading off with it is we need an event at St. Anthony. I, I think that that riding area, if you talk to certain people, it's there's a big collection of people that think that that is the best riding in America. It's the biggest dunes in America. It's the steepest dunes in America. And they've got a trail system out there that is second to none. So, you know, fingers crossed uh, that they do get something put into place to where people can go out there and enjoy something very similar to what was, very similar to what UTV Takeover is doing. So hopefully, you know, by 2020, 2021, that sort of stuff's figured out. But uh, what you're talking about is uh, my brother and I did the Washington Backcountry Discovery Route. And uh, that is a trail that is, I believe it's like 550 to 580 trail off-road trail miles that moves from the west portion of the Cascades at the Oregon border, uh, right on the Columbia, all the way to the Canadian border on the east side of the Cascades. And uh, dual sport riders tackle it a lot. Overlanders tackle it a lot. They'll tackle it in their uh, their Toyotas, their Jeeps. Um, to the best of my knowledge, nobody's ever done it in a UTV. I know there's a few people that have done it and they've done it in stages. You know, we bombed through the whole thing. And uh, it was, you know, I'm not going to say it was a bucket list, but uh, when I f got eyes on that run, it just became like an obsession. We, I wanted to be the first, wanted us to be the first ones to do it. Um, it was uh, every bit of what I built it up to be. <laughs> we talked about riding that ride before. What the right? Hey, wait, who's that? <laughs> 
<laughs> Who's talking to my ears? Yeah. So, uh, welcome. This is Ben, our Thank first you. guest on Side by Side Guys. Hey, congratulations. Get your, get your face on the camera. What are you doing moving around? I'm Ben. I'm yeah. with G Force Off Road. <laughs> um, also, Ian's stepbrother. So, a partner in crime most of the time. If he has some ridiculous idea, I'm usually second in line to do it. Co-conspirator in some, ha- some way? Yeah, he's, yeah. Usually, he's the guy that I go to when I break stuff, too. So, <laughs> yeah. So, I know you have some mechanical skills background on you, too. I do. I was a, I was a automobile, mostly diesel mechanic for a number of years, specializing in the tire industry. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've unfortunately did that for a better part of well, 21 plus years. Yeah, he, he, he's the dude that when he finds out that I broke something and I tell him what I'm about to do to get it fixed, like he will literally just uh, be like, no, 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 just, just, just bring it down here. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So you guys went on the BDR together. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the uh, reason behind going on this? Was it just the fact that it looked awesome or? Uh, there's a number of factors that went into it. Uh, for me, when I bought my Husqvarna 501, which was is uh, for those people who don't know what that is, it's a uh, it's a dual sport enduro dirt bike that probably bears more resemblance to a motocross bike than it does an actual like a uh, dual sport like uh, Suzuki DR650 or a big can- uh, KTM 690 or something. Um, when I got that bike, I had two runs that were in my sights. The BDR was secondary to the Transamerica Trail. Transamerica Trail to still to this day. Um, the only person that's ever done the Transamerica Trail on a UTV is Hubert Rowland. Uh, Hubert is and has been uh, Travis Pastrana's mechanic for a long time. He got a lot of tickets, and tickets don't scare Ben and I. No. <laughs> so. I mean, you just pay them and move on. It's but, the fee for having a good time. That's right. That's right. And uh, the BDR was this run that I discovered this documentary. These guys on uh, BMW and KDM uh, dual sports were taking this five-day run where they're going from Hood River, Oregon, all the way to the Canadian border. And uh, I became obsessed with it. I mean, like I was obsessed with the planning. I was obsessed with getting the rig together. And I would say probably, I think by maybe April – we had a game plan. Like we knew, not only knew what we were going to tackle, we knew, uh, we knew where we wanted to stay. We knew where our fuel pickup points were. We knew what we wanted to bring. Uh, it really became an obsession. And, and Ben, what was your first thought when he was like, Hey, I want to do this. Well, I had two thoughts. One is either it's going to be just tremendous because when you talk about the Pacific Northwest, it's probably one of those trails that people are talking about viewpoints and and fun of ride and and just the whole experience the other thing is 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 the opportunity to possibly see you and crash and burn somewhere (laughs) i think i think in any relationship as far as like brother sister in-law whatever there's always that that desire to have the token to hold over someone's head (laughs) so so to clarify anytime i turn the engine over there's that chance uh, (laughs) that's that's true yeah So what kind of, uh, I mean, I don't want to take up a whole episode on this, but what kind of uh, preparedness did you guys go into? So obviously you're, you're looking at maps and, and navigation things, but what other kind of things were you going through? So mechanically and stuff, I'll, I'll kind of let Ben talk about the mechanics of it. I, I kind of served, I figured out how we were going to get dropped off, where we were going to get dropped off. I figured out some of the logistics stuff and God bless his wife. There's no way this would have happened without her, not a chance. And uh, this is the most desolate remote run I've ever done. You get dropped off and you're done. I mean, like when you do other runs, there's a stage point where you keep your trailer and you'll move your trailer along because obviously we can't drive on highways. So you have to move your trailer in conjunction with your run. There was none of that. We got dropped off basically at the southernmost point and uh, with the expectation that we were going to get picked up in Canada. So there was a lot logistically to figure out that. I was working on that sort of stuff. I plotted all the routes uh, in uh, the Gaia map system. We were running we were running three GPSs. Yeah. Yeah. We were running my Magellan, uh, the Gaia maps, and I think he was running something as well. But it, th- there was a lot that went into this. But in terms of the mechanics and stuff of it, uh, uh, there was some gear that we added to my car uh, that required a lot of wiring and stuff. Ben did all that. You know, Ben got Ben got us prepped to do it you know my my role was essentially you know we we opened up a mutual document and uh, we both use iphones so it was just notes and we would just kind of update a sheet of everything that we're planning on bringing and uh, a lot went into it but i think by the time april rolled around we were really confident 
And Ben, what kind of what kind of things were you taking into consideration going into that? One one of the biggest things was uh, the rugged ruggedness of our side by sides. If, and, and you both had YXZs at that point, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Um, you know, you constantly hear horror stories about some brands and their inability to handle certain types of terrain. So I think that if, if either one of us had had one that was kind of notorious for some kind of a failure, we, w- we took the failure points into account in that ride. So fortunately, the, the YXZs, we both have enough experience that we're pretty confident in their capabilities and uh without that confidence it's just it is just no way it would happen we're we're entirely too far away we're relying on our own abilities and what we can pack with us and uh, without that confidence it's just it we're not willing to take our lives into what kind of um just for example for people that are listening what kind of spare parts or or tools did you guys bring well, unfortunately, we, we talked about the necessity to grab a couple of extra tie rods, but in the process, completely slipped our minds. So um, tie rods are a big thing on the YXZ. Um, but other than that, uh, having tools and wasn't so much in spare parts as a few items that we could kind of band-aid things to try to get us to a trailhead. I went through and found a number of resources in order to, to get toolboxes built specifically for our side-by-side so we don't have the excess weight, but we have everything that we can deal with on the, on the trail. Um, not to mention just trying to throw back and forth at each other about, okay, what are some possible problems that we can have? And just brainstorming about that constantly right. up until we leave yeah and what kind of communication did you guys have was it kind of in your own head in your own helmet the whole time or did yeah. you guys have radios or yeah we both run the 25 watt rugged kit and uh you can't you couldn't pull this off without radios it's just there's no way i would even i'll, I'll be honest with you i wouldn't want to ride with somebody that didn't have radios on a run like this there's just too many turns uh how stretched out would you guys get uh, probably about most, maybe about four or five miles okay. somewhere in there. When you're yeah. twisting and turning, that's yeah. quite a ways though. It's a, it's an incredible amount of ways. Um, I got to say though, uh, in relation to what you were talking about, what did we bring? Both of us had a spare tire. That was first and foremost, but a lot of it is we didn't understand. Uh, I mean, we knew kind of in the back of our mind, what was a weak point that could possibly fail, but you know, we didn't really take that into consideration much past the spare tire. The first 240 miles of this run, because we we hit the starting point and we went all the way north of Ellensburg. That's a big, big chunk. And I want to say uh, day one was in the ballpark of about 240 miles. And those, I would say probably the first 100 miles was violent. You know, maybe 100, 200 uh, 200 miles was incredibly violent. Uh, Ben didn't have a flat tire after day one, but on day one, you had three, if I remember right. And yeah. fortunately, were these punctures or bead? These are punctures. Yeah. And he finished the run on that same tire. You know, he's a, uh, uh, Ben's got a little history with tires. <laughs> so, <laughs> Do. Yeah. I, I know my way around a plug patch. 21 years. 21 plus 20, years. Yeah, yeah. 21 plus years in the tire industry. And uh, so, you know, he was prepared and yep. that didn't slow us down. But I got to say, and we've covered this before on this show, I never once broke camp thinking that uh, we were in for it, thinking that we were in over our head in terms of what our machine would tackle. Like I just expected my machine to just destroy that trail. And it did. It performed amazing. And so did his. Great. Yeah. So just so for people that aren't familiar with the Washington topography, what kind of environments were you guys going through? Uh, Rainforest to pine forest to desert to, I mean, you're talking about a run that starts in Carson, Washington. It goes through... uh, goes through Ellensburg, it goes through Wenatchee, goes through Kashmir, Chelan. So if you can visualize these towns, you know, uh, especially as you start to get north, it gets very uh, desert type terrain. And then by the time you head north of Chelan, you're back into the trees again. And by the time you finish up, it's a little bit of everything. Right. So yeah, I mean, it's rough. We'll just go with that. That trail is very, very rough. If you were to do it in a Toyota or something, it'd probably take about five days, maybe a little bit more. Uh, these machines, we were able to take it down into a, a little over two. So you made it all the way from the Oregon border to the Canadian border? Yeah, I just, I want to say all in six, I want to say it's like 690, 
somewhere in there before yeah, before 86 90 yeah. at the border yeah so what kind of um, uh, takeaways did you guys pull away from that in your in your loadout you're constantly evolving every trip that you go out you're going to think man I should take this I should take that you're going to take things off you're going to add things on you know obviously those points but we also talked a lot about the fact that we were on trails that people that live 15 minutes away from this trail system don't know about them. Right. You know, so we were really fortunate to have the opportunity and take the opportunity in order to do what we did. And, and our primary takeaway from it is if you, if you want the opportunity, you need to take the opportunity. Don't wait for it to come around. Don't right. wait. You need to make it's it. It's not going to find you. Yeah. No. My my takeaway is that never in my life have I ever taken on something where I felt more disconnected and remote. Like you're completely relying on this car. I mean, we, like I said, we got dropped off. And if we had a failure, especially between Kashmir and Chelan, there's some area that you go in there where you're looking down and you can see Leavenworth and you're about the halfway point or something. And, uh, you are so out in the middle of nowhere that in the event that you had a failure, and if there's one thing that I was really, really shocked by is how much our cell phones actually worked on that trip. I mean, there were some areas that was like, there's no way, and we've got signal. It was pretty crazy. What carriers were you on? Both, AT&T and Verizon. I like how you say both as, and there's no other options. <laughs> there are no other options. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I would say probably in that little window, or uh, it's about 140 to 160 miles or something like that between Kashmir and Chelan, and it's all off-road. And you get back into that, and you're just, you, you're so far from anything. And here, here we are. We don't have our truck. We don't have our trailer. All we have is our side-by-sides. And, uh, you know, in essence, told our family members, pick us up in five days up in Canada. You know, so you're just, you're out in the middle of nowhere. That was that was probably the the mo- the pr- the most prevailing thought that I had while we were taking it on was just man we're out in it this is awesome so cool yeah and, and I I would say uh, you know I got asked after we were all done would you ever do it again and the first twenty four hours after that I didn't know how to answer that I'm like yeah maybe you know uh, I would say a day to two days later I'm like not only would I do it again we are gonna do it again. Yeah, I think that's definitely um, an experience that I want to have uh, for sure. And I want to have more experiences like that, right? And uh, we'll get more into maybe some of the future plans going to happen in 2020, uh, maybe in our next episode. But um, the Washington BDR, you know, I wasn't even aware of I wasn't even aware of the BDR like ecosystem that has been developed for these dual sport riders. Um, but it was funny because this summer I was talking with people about we should do this border to border ride and it would be really cool to do multiple states and have multiple rides and all this other stuff. And then come to find out there's people already doing half the work that I would have to do to do that. So um, those resources are going to be really great looking into uh, these future rides that we're looking at doing. And um, Well, I'm telling you right now, when we were up at the border crossing, it's called the Night Hawk Crossing up outside of Oroville, Washington. Uh, we we're both pretty exhausted. I was sitting on my front tires and I posted up a, a link on uh, Facebook right then and there. And it felt good, man, to claim that, you know, knowing that you, we were pretty much the first guys that had done something of that nature. Right. So, and, and, you know, would you I, agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think there's a, there's a little bit of every single UTV owner that says I'm buying this so I can conquer some mountain that I've, you know, in my perception, whether that be a, an actual physical mountain or a, or a trail or an experience or whatever. I think every single person that buys a UTV kind of has that in the back of their head. Like, I want to do this thing that I can say I've done. Yeah. And uh, there's too many of us that have sat around and not done any of those things. Yeah. You get into a rhythm too, when you're on trail, you know, the first couple of hours or something, you're kind of finding your rhythm. And after about six hours, after a couple hundred miles, you're in just into a rhythm where you're predicting everything that your car is going to do. And, right. you know, this is the first venture that we ever did to tackle something like this. And it was a really, really big undertaking. And, you know, had there been like six to 10 machines, I don't think I would have tried it. I don't think I would have done it. Um, if there's one dynamic that Ben and I have is that we don't slow each other down at all. You know, we're on the same, uh, really on the same wavelength in terms of uh, when we're getting up, how quickly it takes us to break down stuff, how quickly it takes us to do maintenance type stuff. And 
uh, neither one of us, uh, neither one of us are a big fan of driving 50 miles and chilling out for two minutes. There's just none of that. Like we want to just eat up miles. Right. And, uh, so, so going and doing something like this with somebody that's very like-minded as you, um, is, is there's definitely a benefit to that. I've since then, a lot of the dialogue on the thread regarding this has been guys wanting to take it on. They want to stay in hotels. I mean, if, if they can figure out how to logistically work that off by all, or work that out, by all means, give it an attempt. But that's just not. I don't think it's the same experience. I, I don't think it would be. No. I think the part of that um, that conquering motivation, right, yep. is to to be one with the adventure. Mm-hmm. And that sounds really hokey pokey, but there's something to be said for you know s- sitting in your car, sleeping with your car, being tore set up, tore down at the you know overnight, and and having to rely on yourself and your machine and the experience and not have to rely on anyone else. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the whole point is that there's not another person there to say that they helped you along. And this particular run can get so remote that it can wear on your psyche a little bit. And if you have, uh, if you have that in you that where you get a little bit frustrated, a little bit of panic or something, this is just not the run for you. Cause I'm telling you, like there's some situations, especially between Kashmir and Shalan. You get up above Shalan, and you're looking down at the lake, and it's a huge lake. And everybody knows in Washington how big that lake is, and it's so close to you. It's probably three miles to five miles straight down this mountain to where you can get to that lake. You're still two hours to two and a half hours from pavement. Right. You know, you can't just hang a right and go down to it and cut off a section. You know, there's road closures and stuff. And it was one of those things where we're up on that and. It was funny because I, I'd seen a, a dual sport guy talk about that. He goes, yeah, it was so frustrating looking down and seeing that lake so close and knowing that there is no way I'm getting there within three to four hours. <laughs> right. That didn't affect us. We were, like I said, we were in a pretty good rhythm by then. Yep. We were racing to that next scenic view. Yeah. Awesome. And if there's one thing I would stress uh, that really caught us off guard is pavement. We put on well over 100 pavement miles. Wow. So you got to take that in consideration. Yeah, and, and not all those pavement miles are necessarily friendly to to UTVs either. Theoretically. <laughs> you know, and, and a lot of that's changed this year. I mean, if we were to look back at 2019, how many times have we seen communities posting on Facebook or whatever saying that they've been pushing for passing ordinances saying right. that they can be on trail or on right. road? So a lot of that's starting to, you know, especially the smaller communities that want the tourism and the, and the, the dollars that come along with that um, are definitely being more open to that idea. So it, We behaved. You know, yeah. it was one of those things we weren't looking to slow anybody down or anything, anything like that. But yeah, we, we weren't out there trying to break land speed records or anything. So, right. And we went into it knowing that we were, we were figureheads of this thing called side by side. And I think that everybody that gets in one needs to realize that they can't be dummies and do stupid things and expect this sport to progress to a point where it, it's accepted. It, it's accepted. Right. And, yeah. You know, we see, we see closures all the time because of people doing stupid things because doing the things that in the, the allotted areas isn't good enough. They need to blaze trail over into this area and it creates problems for, for that area and it gets shut down and, and you just, you need to be responsible stewards. Yeah, back to the knucklehead statement, right? Don't be a knucklehead. Yep. Respect what you're doing, where you're doing it, and with what you're doing it, and to whom may be around what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. there's no shortage of people trying to get riding areas shut down. So Yeah, for sure. And I think there's some battles in the dunes right now on, um, is it California or Oregon? or Both. Yeah. 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 So um, if I could say anything in regards to that, you know, speak up. Go to your your local um, city council meetings or whatever it is that, that may be controlling those decisions, and and represent us in a good light so that yeah. we can continue to do what we do. Yep. All right, September. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Heydays uh, up in Minnesota, and this is not a UTV event, but they do have UTVs there along with all the manufacturers of snowmobiles. They all make UTVs, um, but they also have a racing event in the center area of the uh, event grounds. And uh, typically it has been an obstacle course race where there's lots of tires to go over, jumps, holes, things like that. Uh, but that um, organization fell apart and they they came back with this new one called Championship UTV, which if you search uh, Google for that, you'll come to their website, has basically all the big names in UTVs um, and racing against each other in uh, uh, double elimination type scenarios. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, got to see a lot of cool racers out there, 
seeing the power some of these machines make, can make is, is always awesome to be up cl and close with that. Um, and so if you're a UTV guy uh, this next year and you have the opportunity to visit Heydays, uh, go just to people watch. It's a really entertaining. <laughs> Um, if not anything else, uh, check out some of the cool UTV stuff there uh, as well. So when I was there, um, Polaris released their Polaris General XP 1000 as well. Um, the day we were driving up to the event, they actually announced it and that they were going to give them away at the event. Uh, and so uh, if you haven't seen the Polaris General XP 1000, uh, it brings the whole XP class of upgrades to the General 1000, which includes fender flares, better suspension, better travel, better tires. Um, and all that stuff, which is all stuff that people normally bolt onto the machine as soon as they buy it anyways. So it, it saves you a little bit of money getting to that point, and it's a little bit more of the creature comforts and things that you would want in a general. Um, and it looks phenomenal. They, they, they knocked it out of the park with the color schemes they chose this year. And um, I've always liked the general uh, in its trucky type feel, um, not to mention the fact that it's just a really great platform as well for doing any kind of modding and overlanding and things like that. Yeah, it would be a great car for the BDR. It, uh, I mean, you're not gonna, you're, you've got the space to bring in pretty much any piece of gear that you want, and you're not compromising ride quality. If you right. like to get after it a little bit, uh, the General's a great car. You can throw it around pretty good. I mean, I, I would argue that a General is probably relatively quick in acceleration compared to a YXZ. There, I mean, I'm not gonna say that one's yeah, they're pretty well geared faster than the other. It's uh, pretty comparable. You know, one's gonna turn better, obviously. <laughs> So after that show, uh, the Sand Sport Super Show, that was a pretty big uh, deal this year. Always is. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people. I don't know what the actual uh, count of people going in and out of that, 35, 55,000, somewhere in there. Um, you know, there wasn't really anything too revolutionary there. That was the first time I got into the XP uh, Pro. That was, uh, I'm sorry, the RZR Pro. Um, but, uh, yeah, another great event, great event for the company. Uh, it, <laughs> If you've never been to that event and side by sides are your thing, skip SEMA, go to Sandsport. Yeah, it's you'll a definitely bit, have a, feel more at home. Yeah, it's much more concentrated towards UTV. And the, there was a lot of um, announcements out of that show, which I would have expected to be at SEMA or at a different event. But uh, like Speed UTV, Robbie Gordon's new UTV, UTV manufacturer uh, to build upon his Speed brand um, as it is, uh, came out of the gate saying, hey, we're going to start building our own version of the Wildcat, uh, basically taking that platform and taking it to the next level that he wasn't able to accomplish at um, at Textron. So I'm assuming that it, it was all kind of maybe in the works when it was Arcticat. And then once Textron came on board, they probably nixed a whole lot of that, said it wasn't worth the time and money to invest. Right. And, uh, you know, with Robbie Gordon owning all the patents of the suspension, basically doors down. Um, it makes sense for him to want to continue to invest in his investment into those patents. And, um, you know, he's talking 300 plus horsepower out, straight out of the gate. Um, he's talking, you know, custom suspension, custom everything, um, and starting at 32 grand. So if you're talking about building, let's just say Top Dog right now, X3 Turbo RR, you know, you're already 30 grand into it after taxes and delivery fees and all that stuff. So if you were to take that machine and try to make it 300 horsepower, you're dumping another 15 grand into it. Roughly, yeah. And yeah. so it people look at the speed UTV and they're like, holy crap, that's a lot of money. But if you know what you're getting out of it, it's really not. Well, that's the question. Do we know what we're getting yet? You know, I, I see a lot of this stuff and I have no doubt that it's not accurate or anything. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm just excited to start to see some information sure. come out about it. And I want to see some on the, on trail. Well, and just a simple UTV manufacturer to say, we're going to bring high horsepower, high capability out of the gate versus relying on your third party manufacturers to get you there um, is going to be just awesome competition for Polaris and Can-Am and all those other guys. Um, and if you're in the market for a really high performance capable machine, he's selling his four demo units right now. So he's got, I think two, two seaters and two four seaters, uh, that you can, uh, contact him via social or the website, and you can actually buy those right now today and have them delivered. Yeah, this is going to be a really incredible machine so long as it lives up to everything that's being built up currently. You know, I couldn't tell you how many times over the last... 
I don't know, year and a half, I've heard various companies, I've heard various events and stuff, use coin the term and say over and over again, this is going to change the game. Game changer. Can we stop with that, <laughs> like moving forward forever? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just yeah, let, let's retire that. Mar- no, no, marketing is, oh is too gosh. easy these days for them. It, it really is. Yeah. So uh, if they live up to the hype, um, we have a really interesting 20, yeah. 21 year span to kind of look forward to. Um, and then, uh, we have the release of King shocks and shock therapy, both saying they're jumping on board the live valve, uh, system as well at that show. So King showed off that they're going to have, uh, independent controlled, um, actuated clickers for your, um, King shocks. Um, and we, we pinged them, uh, right before the show and, uh, they came back with a $1,150, upgrade charge for your shocks. So if, if you want to do the live valve in 2020, summer 2020, and you have King shocks, it's going to be about $1,200 upgrade per shock to do the live valve system plus the controller and everything else. That's it? Eleven fifty. Yeah. Do, I mean, it's a steal, right? Do they take Apple Pay? I, I, I would, that'd be some good cash back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then shock therapy came out saying they're going to do the live valve upgrades to any Fox shock. So as long as you have a Fox shock with a clicker on it, they would be able to adapt to install uh, as part of their um, ride suspension upgrades they do in house uh, these live valves to the shocks and then have the controller uh, integrated into the CAN bus and and all that other stuff as well. So when you factor in the difference in price between the dynamics and the velocity, uh, at least when it first came to market, it was very substantial. It was probably right. about double what they're asking for for this modification, and I I think that's totally reasonable. I mean, you think about what you're doing, you're, you're taking out the manual process of a shock adjustment completely out of the game. You don't have to stop, you don't have to adjust, you don't have to think, you don't have to do anything. You just say, cushy or stiff, and you're good. As a 43-year-old, I appreciate that. <laughs> so uh, if you're in the market um, to upgrade your ride quality and adjustability without buying a whole new suspension, uh, definitely look into those for 2020. Yeah, so in uh, my personal uh, ventures in September, uh, that firewall that I punctured with a tree, uh, that small little thing, I replaced that firewall and that I just wanted to let everybody know you literally take the entire front end of your machine apart to get to the firewall. Like there is no getting around it. There's no shortcuts. There's no tricks to know. It is, you're going to take the entire front end of your machine apart to get to your firewall. You have to take the whole dash off the whole hood system, the whole quarter panels, everything. And when I got down to a point where I could actually take the firewall out, I was literally sitting in a razor with no front end on it. Like all you had was tires and shocks. And that was a surreal kind of like sitting there looking at it going, oh, that's all that's there. (laughs) Like behind all the plastic, that's all that's there. Uh, So to build on the, the realization of, you know, these things aren't, you know, indestructible and a tree can go through and kill you at any moment in time. Uh, also seeing that open and exposed you're kind of thinking oh oh yeah this is just a basically a a tube box with an engine and suspension on it so uh that was that was really interesting you know as i had said uh before i had worked at 509 for six and a half years so a big change in my life uh, and going forward for side by side guys is that uh, i left 509 to pursue my uh, passions which is side by sides and the utv industry and community and um it's basically taken every penny and dime I've had to kind of catch back up from all the things in life that get put aside when you're working 10 to 15 hours a day on everything. And so I'm at a point now where we're all caught up and we can start focusing on things. Um, and, you know, I'm working on the side as a freelancer in technology and websites and media and all this other stuff to kind of fund my efforts in this venture. So if you're a, a brand out there that's looking for someone capable to handle uh, some technology that you're not able to do, hit me up. Um, and uh, but anyways, uh, looking to to push side by side guys further into events, into trail rides, into adventures, um, product testing and development, things like that. And we have a lot of really big ideas that we want to kind of bring to market. And so I'm really excited to have this left um, in front of me to conquer. So this is my big conquering moment, right? Like I got to put all the effort in to climb this mountain and, and succeed at it. So a lot of weight on my shoulders, but I'll tell you what, and I'm sure you probably know what, you know, when you're working every day on the same thing for year after year after year, you just get burnt out 
and it, there's a time and a place to change direction and go after what you you enjoy and the people you like being around and I can't tell you how much uh, less stress I have at day to day and how much happier I am and how much more I smile uh, that I don't uh, have a nine to five anymore. And um, I'm really looking forward to what uh, self-employment brings and, and the adventures we get to go down because of it. October. So we uh, launched Side by Side hey. Guys Off-Road Podcast hey. in October. We huh? do, do my best Larry David in, in person. Hey! hey. <laughs> so uh, pretty proud of where we've gotten in the short couple months uh, that we've been doing this. Um, and uh, I think the quality's there. I yeah. think the personality's there. The reception's been great. Thank everyone. Just couldn't thank people enough uh, between companies and just people that are listening in. The feedback's been fantastic, and uh, that's why we do it. I mean, we have a yeah. passion. We have a passion for it. Kind of saw a void in this regard, and we love talking about it. For sure. And nope. What's, what's that? <laughs> and groundbreaking. Yeah, I mean, like, no one's doing this in our industry, right? So uh, the side-by-side -side world, uh, for some reason, um, tends to take technology and movement in tech yeah. a little slower than everybody else. So anyways, everybody that's subscribed, everybody that's given us feedback, we really appreciate it. Uh, we look forward to this every time we do it. Um, and if we're long winded, uh, we apologize. We just got really big mouths and a lot of wind behind them. So um, that's exactly why we decided to record it. Um, and uh, we look forward to what the new year brings and uh, the people that we're going to meet and interview and all these good things that are coming down. So uh, look forward to 2020. We hope to see you there and uh, hope you keep listening. All right. So biggest news in October was Kawasaki launched their KRX and bringing yet another uh, competitor to the UTV market. Um, you know, the, there was a lot of hype and, and hysteria around the fact that they were actually getting to the point of launching. Um, I think that there was a little bit of disappointment on the performance numbers, but uh, now that we're a couple months into having hands-on as an industry, hands-on the KRX, um, everybody that's had one loves it and doesn't seem to have a whole lot of negative feedback on it outside of maybe being top heavy and underpowered. Yeah. The footage I'm seeing of it, I'm seeing guys go out and do everything anybody else is doing on a naturally aspirated machine. You know, I mean, I've seen those things in dunes paddled up. I've seen them out in rocks. And like you said, the people that are out there driving them don't have any complaints and you should probably listen to them mm -hmm. as opposed to what you see on a spreadsheet for what its horsepower numbers are or its right. actuation numbers until you get behind well the there's a reason they haven't published the horsepower exactly. numbers but <laughs> yeah well yeah i mean i i did hear that a guy told me that a a, a 1000 ranger beat one in a drag race pretty well, routinely I, that would be pretty harsh uh, considering a ranger is pretty pretty low geared <laughs> yeah yeah so anyways they've been doing pretty well the market's been had a really good reception of them and uh i think we're gonna see a whole lot more in that um uh, vendor area right and i think they're going to have a couple more models to bring out i don't think they're going to be sit still in it very long yeah trail hero trail hero yeah utv sports magazine put on an event down in san hello utah and they uh, had a documentary crew there and filmed the whole thing and be on the lookout probably sometime in 2021 i'm not 100 percent sure what the release date's going to be but they did a documentary it's going to be on amazon prime I'm really looking forward to that. There was a lot of vendors that we see at all these similar shows, you know. Um, oh, gosh, who was there? Uh, SSV, Rugged Radio. Just It's just literally a who's who of mm -hmm. the people that we see on this tour circuit. And uh, it, it was really cool to see this get put together. Full Throttle wasn't there. Probably going to change that in 2021, assuming that they do this again. But uh, it, it, was, it was really neat. And it, you want to talk about it took over my, my Explorer feed. On Instagram, virtually when I would hit that hourglass and, or I'm sorry, with that uh, magnifying glass and look at my Explorer feed, there was so much stuff coming off Trail Hero from other vendors. So, and for those that don't um, know the Trail Hero, uh, what what kind of riding, what kind of an event is it? Well, uh, Sand Hollow has everything. It has some of the rock crawling, very similar to what you would see in Moab. It has sand dunes, it has trails, it has everything. And uh, if you're following UTV Takeovers webpage. Um, they're in the process of putting an event together down there in, I want to say, the first part of October of next year. So we we will definitely be hitting southern Utah next year. Really excited about that. Utah is one of those states where it's just like off-road heaven for anyone that has a machine. It's like Idaho. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, between Utah and Idaho, they're basically just two very large national parks. <laughs> 
So also in October, Polaris came out with their four seater Pro XP, which you know we were all expecting. Um, it was a little earlier than I was expecting. I was expecting maybe later in the year or maybe spring. Of all the releases, though, that's one that caught me off guard the most because every here we were thinking that uh, nothing's going to happen for the rest of 2019, and then they just bam threw out yeah. a video and hey, we got a four seater now. That yeah. kind of came out of nowhere. Which is funny because when when they launched the two seater, there was actually a picture on their website of a two seater and a four seater going in the dunes. And so I I had went to go screenshot it, but they had taken it down by the time I had gotten to go screenshot it. But other guys had done it and had had, had that image going around. But um, I had seen pictures of it being in testing form months in advance. But uh, the fact that they came out in late 2019 instead of in early 20, um, I think is an indicator that in early 20, we're going to see, you know, possibly a turbo s upgrade right so, that, so. That, that'll be interesting uh takeover in coos bay uh we talked a bit about to takeover already yeah takeover we were essentially going to do like a synopsis of all the takeover events and my i would insist just go to the website see what their event schedule looks like and if you get a chance check it out you will not regret it so much fun so in November, uh, we didn't really expect anything to come out. Again, we've talked about this before, where we were just expecting nothing as far as news goes. And right after uh, SEMA, Segway, or I should say at SEMA, Segway came out of left field and said, hey, we're going to play too. And came out with their Segway Villain and Fugelman Hybrid UTVs. So do I have to be the guy to ask this question, but have you heard anything since? Zero. Nothing. Now, I've had... Um, some interest, I mean, I've been poking around the webs trying to figure out who's manufacturing parts for them. Uh, we came out, uh, and figured out that they were, they have a, um, I think it's a Finnish or a Swedish, uh, shock manufacturer making their shocks. But, um, yeah, there's really not been any more news on the motor, on the suspension, on the features outside of the fact that, uh, it's going to be a hybrid drivetrain. So it's going to be a magnetically assisted, uh, torque converter, I think. Right. Yeah. I guess the synopsis is we'll see. I hate I hate that. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll yeah. See. Looking forward to it. I mean, if they can come out of the gate with a solid platform that has a really effective hybrid drivetrain yeah. that can prov- provide the torques that they're talking about, I mean, that's going to be a game changer as far as drag race performance um, and things like that out of corners and out of shoots. So... Uh, and then again, mentioned SEMA, you were there, you had a great time, saw a lot of your buddies there. Yeah. Yeah. SEMA was great. Uh, we, we dedicated an issue or uh, issue. Hello. We dedicated an episode where we kind of covered SEMA. Um, if you definitely want the, if you want the play by play on kind of how that went, I would, I would recommend checking that out, but you know, nothing too revolutionary. It was a great show for us. We had a lot of fun out there and there was some, uh, you know, UTV is, uh, gaining a footprint out there. You definitely yeah. saw it in audio. Um, and that's why we talk about it, right? It's not because SEMA is some amazing UTV off-road thing, but it's just the fact that we're being represented more and more there. No doubt. No doubt. Um, and uh, you had some big news and change shake up in your uh, side-by-side portfolio. Yeah, I, uh, I sold my YXZ. I spent a pretty good t- amount of time listening to things like Air Supply and uh, Chicago and <laughs> a bunch of, you know, it was essentially like a, a death in the family, but uh, we moved past it. Picked up a 2019 X3RC, a uh, 72-incher, and um, basically that build is in the process of moving forward as we speak. Uh, there's a, no shortage of companies that, are, thankfully, have uh, uh, offered some support. And, you know, it's a very similar to what my YXE. You know, my YXE got built in a time frame that with it, without that support, it probably would have been another year before it was where it was. So, uh, you know, the X3, I'm, I'm hoping to have it uh, almost, we're, we're going to do this uh, little ride out in uh, Winchester Bay at the end of February. I think the, I think what's called is Goons in the Dunes. And I'm hoping to have it probably about 70% done by then and 100% done by the end of May. So, yeah, that's kind awesome. Of, yeah, and probably to be no shortage of content that uh, you and I are going to develop around kind of how that thing starts to For take sure. shape. Yeah, we'll be seeing a lot more of that on our YouTube channel. So, right. uh, again, like and subscribe. Um, <laughs> so, how many miles do you have on it now? 
Eh, under 100. Yeah. yeah. You're getting there, though, it's not, it's above 50. Eh, it was 16 degrees this morning. So, <laughs> yeah, I would love to go ride it, but it's it's cold. Um, so we've, we've it's, talked it's to you. It's over 50, though. We've talked to you about kind of your first impressions, and we put out a first impressions video on the YouTube channel so that you can go see the walk around and maybe some of the features of that. Now, Ben, you've been a YXZ guy your whole UTV life as well, right? So, yeah. um, you know, you had a, at least a few minutes of seat time in it. What were your first thoughts? And the X3, wow. Um, obviously, some jealousy happened. There's, there's a little, little envious of him. But uh, and I, is that in the horsepower, or is that in the horsepower, chassis, or horsepower? Just the raw horsepower. Know, yeah, I've always been kind of a horsepower guy. I enjoyed some fast cars when I was young, and and uh, this was my opportunity to get into something that was comparable to that. And it does not disappoint. It's, it's holy cow fast when you really get after it right and, and being the 2019 we're talking the 172 horsepower right not the 195 that came out and correct and for this next year's model yeah for what we want to target horsepower wise it's totally attainable you know I, I want somewhere around 185 to the wheels maybe 195 i feel like that's that's a perfect number for sand yeah is right in there because i mean the, you know if i've said it once i've said it a million times the more the more power the more paddle the more paddle the less maneuverability and i think 185 is right. right about that sweet spot now ben compared to the yxz and coming off the bdr run that you guys did and maybe some other writing that you've done how how did the chassis size the, the wheelbase and everything else i mean you didn't you haven't had a lot of experience in it yet but uh just the first impressions like did it did it feel that much bigger um it does they're they're you know, obviously, you're talking apples and oranges just simply because one's a 64, one's a 72. Suspensions are drastically different. Horsepower is drastically different. But spending enough time in my YXZ and noticing trail widths and things like that. And, and I think at 72 inches, it's going to be a real con consideration going into some of those areas. Yeah. Um, not necessarily on the BDR because most of the BDR was fairly uh, wide as far as that's concerned. I didn't really feel that we were ever tight. Right. But there are some other things that we've got kind of in the works that that 72 inches is going to make a pretty serious difference. Awesome. Yeah. If you uh, if you open the suspension up on the YXE, just loosen everything up, the ride quality on the BDR. I mean, I, that's what I did with my car. And it was like riding a Cadillac out there. I mean, it was rough. It was really violent, but it didn't beat you up too much. And with this X3, if there's one thing I notice about this X3 is it just does everything a little easier. Right. So less brain power to go and right. have fun. It's not fast enough for me, but it will. It will be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's ever been a performance uh, enthusiast that said they had enough horsepower. So, well, I, I was driving it the other day, and I was doing like 75 on this dirt road, and and I hit the gas, and it kind of the front end started to really come up a little bit, uh -huh. you know, which was satisfying. So then I slowed down <laughs> to about 70 again, then I hit it again, and it didn't come up the second time. I'm like, yeah, we got to change that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I need I need it to or uh, just get you off the gravel. I need it to be a little bit scary. <laughs> yeah. I, I, the squirrelier, the better. Building off of uh, what I was mentioning about going in uh, to this uh, side by side guys uh, full time, uh, we remodeled the garage and kind of finished it up. It wasn't insulated or anything before. And being up here in the Northwest, that makes life not so much fun when you're on the concrete. And uh, so we finished out the garage uh, and built a whole um, space where we can film um, various different topics and installation videos and um, maybe some other fun stuff out there. So uh, looking forward to spreading my wings and doing some more video uh, in the garage and showing you guys some more products and, and features. So that'll be a lot of fun. Um, just real quick, Tesla announced their Cybertruck, has nothing to do with off-road, but at the end of their show, they drove an electric ATV into the back of it. Now, don't really care about the ATV personally, but does that indicate any possible interest that they may compete with Segway on the hybrid or the electric and with Nikola with their electric? Do you think do you think Elon has any wild hairs up his butt that he might want to go into the side-by-side -side world? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm rejecting the technology. It's just the sheer volume of internet hate when they release pictures on that. Just, uh, just thinking about more and more rounds of just people just, just uh, dead air, <laughs> dead air. Yeah. Well, I think it'd be an interesting uh, concept of, you know, Segway's big, 
right? They've been around for a while. Nikola's new. They got a lot of investor money, but they don't have any proven things out on the market, right? Uh, the concept of a, of a proven uh, brand out on the market to say, hey, we've been in this game for a number of years now, and we have a lot of smart people working for us, and we can manufacture the batteries and all this other stuff. I mean, they, they flip and put rockets in the space and then land them back out on boats. Like, they're pretty smart guys over there. Can you imagine what they would do with the UTV? Um, but that being said, Tesla's not necessarily the best financial investment for a lot of people. So uh, I don't know if they'd go into that kind of risky business uh, out of the gate. So, uh, and then December, uh, as news uh, feeds start slowing down. Um, we published our holiday episode of the podcast along with our stocking stuffer gift guide and picks for the holiday season gifts. Uh, that turned out pretty well. If uh, you're listening to this before Christmas, go check it out um, if you need any last minute ideas uh, for your UTV loved one. And then uh, I just had a quick little thought uh, before we started the show about I saw a commercial. Uh, I think it was for a GMC truck and noticed that they had the truck pulling two side by sides on a trailer. And then shortly after that, um, saw a trailer for Jumanji, the next movie of Jumanji coming out that has a whole segment of the movie that's all in the sand with a bunch of uh, side by sides as well. And then I saw Apple come out with an uh, made with Apple ad where they show off that they can do film with their cameras or their cell phones. Um, and it was all um, side by sides in the desert in Dubai or something like that. So most of it was all Polaris, right? Um, there was, I think there was a Razor and an X3 or oh, a Razor gotcha. or an YXZ or something like that. There was two different UTVs involved. But I just thought it was an interesting, you know, where we're looking back at the year and how the industry's progressed and how these new units have come out and maybe some of these events where we our perceptions are starting to change on certain things or whatever. But we're seeing them more and more in media. We're starting to see them in like actual big time production type stuff where uh, in the past, like in a movie, you would see them come out with some sort of custom made four wheeler Jeep thing that would look futuristic or part of the movie or whatever. And now we're starting to see them actually brought in as what they are, just maybe with some newer quote unquote plastics on them or something. Uh, and then we're seeing them in the commercials, like people are starting to the actual consumer market, the the broad consumer market of everybody is starting to recognize side by sides as a normal thing to where it's now becoming an advertisement token. Right. You're starting to see it selling trucks, starting to see it selling um, the idea of fun and action and excitement. So um, I just thought that was an interesting topic to look back at 2019 as I think in 2018 Westworld or Westwood, whatever that HBO show was, um, they had some X3s in it and that right. made a big hoopla for at that at that time. Uh, but now we're, we're considering the idea that we're getting mass adoption of the idea that side by sides are a thing and what that means maybe going forward into the next year or years of you know, are we going to start seeing more companies jumping in like Segway and, and um, Kawasaki? Or are we going to see maybe more affordable options where they're not quite so spendy and we're starting to see the quote unquote normal consumers that maybe wouldn't spend so much money on a, a, a rig? And maybe maybe Polaris comes out with a new Ace, you know, to kind of fill out that middle market or a new RS1 or RS.5 you know, like a half size version or something. Um, I mean, think about it. If, if Polaris came out with an RS like 900 where it's 50 some inches wide, want single seater, I think they would have just as much of adoption as the RS one does. Potentially. I mean, all the guys that are in the trails and they're saying 64 is just too wide. If you came out with a 54 inch version, I think that'd be gangbusters. Potentially, yeah. So, anyways, uh, I just thought it was an interesting kind of just subconscious thing I noticed where we're seeing more and more side-by-sides in the film industry, the commercial industry, and it's becoming more of a normal, normal, quote-unquote normal thing uh, that people are starting to recognize. When I first started driving my YXE in my open trailer behind my pickup down the highway, I'd pull in and get gas somewhere for my truck, and you would have people come up to that car. And mind you, it was pretty built out. They would come up and be like, basically, what the expletive is that? Right. You know, 
that now, looks like fun. <laughs> now it's now it's pretty much nothing. You right. know, pretty much people you know, people are so used to seeing these things that it seems like uh, the people that are coming up and checking them out are other enthusiasts. Right. So. So, anyways, I thought that was a good closure to the to the year. We're knowing. mainstream now. Yeah, we're yeah. we're just run of the mill. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, just to wrap things up, um, you know, from the bottom of my heart, thank you to everybody that has been following what we're doing, subscribing, sharing with their friends that um, you know there's this cool podcast. Um, hopefully, uh, everyone that subscribes to the podcast goes out and follows our Instagram, Facebook. Um, YouTube channel yeah. and all that as well. Uh, we're going to have contributing too. Yeah, we're looking for well, feedback. Like, yeah. if you have something to say or you have an idea or a thought, like, we want to hear it. Yeah. That, I mean, we thrive on that. Yeah, stuff, the so. holiday episode was very. I mean, just thank you so much. We got so much uh, feedback on that. So yeah. yeah. So um, the which UTV to buy uh, for the different type of riders? That was a huge feedback thing for us. Um, I got a lot of feedback on guys that now are are asking, you know, hey, you should do a show based off of this and and whatever. Like, like give us that that feedback. We we want to hear it. We want to know what you guys want. Um, we have a lot of things to say, but if it doesn't mean anything to you, we don't want to say it. So uh, we definitely want to make sure we're covering all the bases that um, the community is looking for. So uh, please follow us comment below the videos comment on our po social posts uh, we're there to discuss we're there to give feedback if you have a question on your side by side on why it broke what what how to fix it how to identify something shoot us a message we're more than happy there was a guy the other day he was it was like eight o'clock nine o'clock at night and he's like hey is anyone available to chat just want to talk about this issue i'm having um, and we went through some things and gave him some pointers he was able to go on his way and find the actual cause of the problem and, and fix it so um definitely we want to hear back we want to get introduced to people we want to know who you are um, if you see us out and about at events come say hi shake our hand take a picture whatever like we just want to meet you talk with you and uh see how this community can grow so um yeah thanks. anything else Ethan? thanks for joining us today ben yeah ben it was great to have you on yeah thank you for having me appreciate it and uh just uh, a little teaser we're putting together a little film thingy about the bdr so look forward to that soon and um ben and, and ian were are the stars of that show so uh that will be getting uh, out fairly soon and then uh, we got a lot of stuff coming up so next show we're gonna hopefully to be talking about 2020 what uh, events are coming up things that we're gonna be working on and uh what you can be involved in what you can participate in and contribute to and things like that so anyways great show thanks for joining me ian thanks for joining me ben and uh we look forward to 2020 peace Thank <laughs> you.